Well, good evening and welcome. It is Thursday, March 11th, 2021, and the time is 6.30 p.m. I'd like to welcome everybody to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Independent School District 191 School Board. Director Werb, would you please lead, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will begin with an approval of tonight's agenda. I will ask for a motion for the approval of tonight's agenda. So moved. Moved by Director Connor. May I have a second, please? I second. Seconded by Director Werb. Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Alt. Aye. Chester. Aye. Connor. Aye. Hume. Aye. Miller. Aye. Saeed. Aye. Werb. Aye. Motion to approve the agenda passes unanimously. We will now move to the information section of tonight's meeting, beginning with a presentation um, on our Alternative Learning Center Partnership. Presenting tonight will be Jason Sellers, coordinator of ALC and ABE. So Sellers, the microphone is yours. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Board Chair Miller, uh, Board Directors, and Superintendent Battle. I'm here uh, to ask, to answer any questions that you may have regarding the ALC partnership agreement that we've established with Prior Lake and Shakopee. About two years ago, uh, the Minnesota Department of Education sent a communication to all superintendents indicating that they had a reinterpretation of statute around ALC programming. To be clear, when I use the term ALC, I mean Area Learning Center, and there are four components to that. It does not just mean an ALC high school. In terms of the revised interpretation of statute, MDE indicated uh, that an intermediary uh, could serve as a um, partner, but that then that intermediary, like District 287, uh, like District 916, like District 917, those intermediaries would have to be the fiscal host, take our data, report that data to MDE. MDE would then return the reimbursement and any red flags on the data, and then send that back to our district. Uh, we had previously, in a written agreement, had a partnership agreement with an intermediary. Under this new interpretation, uh, MDE encouraged districts uh, to partner with other local school districts that weren't intermediaries. In your board packet, there is an ALC partnership agreement. Uh, uh, myself and others collaborated with uh, our light counterparts in both Shakopee and Prior Lake. We collaborated under to we collaborate we collaborated to create this partnership for three basic goals. First is to increase the partnership amongst our three districts in serving students who access ALC services K-12. Second, to provide more effective programming for those students and families across our districts. And third, to build regional support and be more efficient with how ALC high schools, ALC middle school day programs and targeted services programming uh, actually works. There are two benefits that are um, outstanding uh, with regard to this partnership agreement. The first is it allows us on a more consistent basis to share what's working and what's not working across our three districts. And our three districts oftentimes share many of the same students depending upon the time of the year. The second uh, main advantage is that without having a, a, a partnership agreement with another district, um, we would not be able to provide extended day or extended year targeted services. Our extended day targeted services programs are our after school elementary PALS program and our after school middle school BYC program. Our summer programming has changed drastically in the last three years. You've seen me come to you and report about it. That is our K-7 summertime programming, uh, which is now six weeks, and our eighth grade STEM program, which was brand new two years ago, and our credit recovery program. And so I will yield the floor to any questions that you may have. Excellent, thank you. Uh, board members, I'd uh, ask if you have any questions. Um, if so, please just indicate by raising your virtual hand and I'll call on you. Good 
Any questions? All right. Not seeing any, Ms. Schellers, I would say you must have given a very thorough presentation. So thank you for your time this evening. Uh, we will now move to the next section of our informational meeting tonight, and that is to discuss advancement via individual determination, otherwise known as AVID, a 2019-20 report and adaptations for 2020-21. Speaking tonight, Franny Becker, AVID coordinator, Danielle Christie, Burnsville High School, and Amy Smalley from Nicollet Middle School. Welcome, and especially welcome to our young presenters this evening. Franny, I will turn it over to you. Oh, there you go. Thank you. Uh, so board, uh, board Chair Miller, Dr. Batto, and members of the board, we are very thankful to be able to be here to present to you about AVID. Um, you will hear through our voice and how we present that the three of us are highly passionate about AVID in the district. Um, with me is Amy Smalley. She is the site coordinator of AVID at Nicollet Middle School and Danielle Christie, who is the site coordinator of AVID at the high school. What that means as site coordinators is they are teachers within both of those buildings, but they also help to implement AVID in the buildings. And um, what's really exciting to have both of them here presenting to you is that they have both been with AVID since the start in the district nine years ago, since the very, very start, and went to some of the very first trainings um, with AVID and have been with it as it continues to grow. So we'll go to our first uh, slide. So our purpose today is we're going to give you an overview of what AVID is. Um, and how we implement it here in District 191. We are gonna give you some participation in some impact data for AVID, and then we're going to give you information on the evaluation status of each of our AVID sites. And so before I go any further, um, as a reminder, AVID is secondary in ISD 191. So it is in all four of our secondary sites. Um, it is not in our elementary sites. So this presentation is about um, the two middle schools, BAS and BHS. Next slide. So I thought I'd start out with, give us a little taste of AVID. So AVID always starts Every training you ever go to with AVID starts with an essential question. Um, and essential questions are something that if you were to visit an AVID elective classroom, you would see essential questions also used. And so an essential question, it's really the heart of a subject. It's supposed to support our inquiry into the subject and it helps lead us. Um, it helps drive what the learning experience is gonna be like. So our essential question that will help drive our learning today is, how how does ISD 191 leverage the average college and career readiness framework to support culturally proficient school system? Next slide. So AVID's mission is to close the achievement gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. And if you read that mission statement and you think to yourself, that sounds very familiar, you're correct because it aligns very tightly with ISD 191's mission statement, which is each student future ready and community strong. There, I mean, that's one of the reasons why AVID is such a tight fit for our district, because what AVID's mission statement is and what ISD 191's mission statement is are closely aligned. Next slide. So, I think at our last board meeting, I believe I presented this, so I will go over it again because we always go back. I go to the triangle. We always go back to the AVID triangle. Um, and the AVID triangle, when we look at the top of the triangle, it the top part there, I always point to my computer like you can see. So the top part of the triangle, we have rigorous academic preparedness, student agency, and opportunity knowledge those are what we need to develop in students. Those are what our students leaving ISD 191 need to be successful 
um, and in a future career or in a in college if they continue on in college. Um, college. The bottom part of the triangle is what we need to do as educators in the district, that for all of our students, we need to insist on rigor. We need to break down barriers that may be in the way of that opportunity knowledge for our students. We need to align our work. So we need to constantly, constantly look at our 612 system to align our work, and we need to advocate for our students. And so when we do those two things together, we get that college and career readiness framework that is at the heart of everything. The way that AVID likes to explain this pyramid is that is if we think about, we are constantly, our students have a backpack and we're constantly giving our students experiences that they put into the backpack but we can't just give students experiences and fill the backpack up. What we need to do is we need to take that backpack, we need to take those experiences in the backpack and we need to take, teach the students how to take those experiences and use the experiences. Because if we just fill it up and we don't teach our students how to use those experiences, we aren't moving things forward. And that's one of the things I love about the framework because it is about, how do we empower our students to go forward and with experiences? We're gonna to go to the next slide. And with that, I am going to have Danielle Christie is going to um, explain to us the AVID elective and the AVID curriculum. Great. Hi, um, like um, Franny said, I'm Danielle Christie. I'm the uh, AVID coordinator at Burnsville High School. And I also teach um, this year, a lot of AVID classes in the virtual academy. Um, the AVID elective is kind of the backbone. It's probably where, um, you know, historically AVID started was with this um, idea that we can take a group of kids and um, really give them a bridge to um, that support for being college ready. Um, the AVID elective is, you know, we're going on 30 years of the AVID elective um, for AVID, AVID being um, for its birth. Um, for its age, I should say. So I think it's been, you know, it's been revised quite a bit, but they stuck to their to their formula, which is we have a couple days, um, two days every week dedicated to tutorials. And we bring in tutors um, where students are able to um, take um, confusion that they have from any class and they're able to coach one another. So when I say tutorials, a lot of times people think of like a tutor just um, telling a student the right answer. The philosophy behind tutorials is that we, we practice coaching students to the right answer. Um, we want students to be resilient and be able to figure out, you know, we always say when you're a freshman in college sitting in the library, um, you're not gonna have your tutor with you. So how can you, um, how can you practice resiliency to find a, find out exactly what your point of confusion is, and then what are your resources and what kind of questions can you ask in order to find a solution? So for two days out of our week, we do tutorials. The other, so that's two days. Two, um, two of the other days um, out of our week of five in AVID, we have curriculum that's written by AVID, um, curriculum that includes standards. Um, they have weeks at a glance, so they have, um, content and um, and learning strategies that um, go into all the college readiness and um, the curriculum also works with like um, um, reading strategies and writing strategies, um, inquiry strategies and collaboration strategies. And then the last day, the final day of our week, we typically do um, college readiness, um, college readiness activities or we would do a community building activity. Um, a lot of times we take the kids, um, not a lot of times, we try to take the kids on field trips to go on college tours. We have a lot of speakers come in um, to share about their, their journey to college or their journey through college. Um, so it's a very college, um, college going culture in the AVID elective. That's kind of the goal. We always say the students do commit when they, when they get accepted to AVID, they do commit to going to college. The AVID curriculum, okay, so AVID elective has its own curriculum. 
the AVID curriculum um, is based upon this idea of WICKER. And WICKER, um, you'll see on the right of the slide here, is stands for Writing, Inquiry, Collaboration, Organization, and Reading. Um, and Amy is going to talk in a second here about how WICKER is really just best practices, um, all of the best practices that kind of have been tried and true, and they're just bundled by AVID. Um, and Amy's going to talk about that. All right, good evening. Um, next slide then, please. Thank you. Uh, so Danielle talked about the AVID secondary or the AVID elective within the secondary schools. And again, this is happening at all of our secondary schools, 612. Um, AVID school-wide really means that there's a college going post-secondary culture building wide, not just within the AVID elective, it's throughout the entire building. Um, it means the staff has committed to helping students keep all doors open to their futures and their dreams. Um, throughout the building, when you walk through and through AVID building, you can see um, AVID in all the content areas. Teachers are ensuring that their lessons do include those wicker strategies. They include, um, you know, as they're planning their lessons, they're looking at writing. Are there opportunities for inquiry, collaboration? Am I teaching the students how to organize notes or access information from their reading level through, um, through their content area with reading? Um, so all of those are pieces that come into play building wide. And when a school is building wide, it's not just seen in those AVID elective classes, it's seen everywhere. Um, AVID school wide, when fully implemented, is not just a program. Uh, it is really a way of thinking, kind of, of acting, and it's just of being, kind of how you are, how you run each day-to-day -day operation in your building. Uh, AVID school wide, when, oops, I just said that. <laughs> um, it's just really who we are and what we do. We strive to be AVID schools and not just schools with AVID. Uh, Franny hears me say that all the time, like we're not a school with AVID, we are an AVID school. It's how we think, it's what we do and it's best practice for our students. We can go to the next slide. So the next slide, I'm gonna talk about monitoring and evaluation of AVID. So we don't get to just say, hey, we're an AVID school. <laughs> like we heard about AVID and we wanna say we're AVID. That would be lovely if it was that easy, but it's not that easy. <laughs> so AVID has a very rigorous process that you must follow to be to call yourself AVID schools. And so part of that process is you have a coaching and certification instrument tool. And with that coaching and certification instrument tool, there's four areas. There's the area of instruction, systems, leadership, and culture. You have to collect evidence and data within all, within all four of those areas. And so evidence can be, um, comes from a lot of things. So we collect evidence through classroom visits. Um, the building leadership teams will do walkthroughs of the whole building. You are looking at what's happening in, happening in the hallways. You're seeing um, what types of images are around the building for students. You're looking at, um, you're doing audits of the building leadership team notes. You're seeing how many times is the AVID leadership team meeting? Is there an AVID leadership team? You are monitoring, I monitor for the buildings. When is, um, when is AVID professional development happening? It needs to happen throughout the year for the staff and are we embedding that in? Um, it also, you're also looking at student schedules. Um, what do we have, like what numbers of students are in the AVID electives, how many students are taking um, advanced placement classes. Danielle is going to talk a little bit more about senior data because we have to um, collect some very, very specific high school data in the coaching and certi certification instrument. And then one of the things that goes with that as um, the district director of AVID I have to I have to attend yearly training because I am the one that certifies if um, the information that our site coordinators collect. So they collect all of this information and with their principals and their AVID leadership teams, they'll go through the coaching and certification instrument and then they have a day where they do presentations to me and I have to certify. Um, I have gone through extensive training with AVID to go through 
um, the coaching and certification tool. And once they do the presentation to me, I certify and say, yes, this is correct. And then we turn the coaching and certification instrument tool into AVID. And that is where we, um, next slide, please. Oh, and that is where we'll um, know what the uh, building is. Is this my slide, ladies? Yes. Okay. So part of the data that we collect is we always are looking at um, these numbers. And so the numbers that we look at are how many students are in the AVID elective. So AVID does give us a number that we are supposed to hit for students that are in the elective based on the size of your building. And so we do hit those numbers. So in um, at Nicollet Middle School in seventh and eighth grade, we have 78 students. At Eagle Ridge, we have 75 students. And you might ask yourself, but there's sixth grade at the middle schools because we have chosen to go with a system under the guidance of AVID. So we, when we made this change, we worked very closely um, with our um, AVID representative who supports us that all sixth grade students would participate in what we call AVID Light. So that before they make that commitment to be in AVID, we want every student to really understand what AVID is and to participate in AVID life, light and have it really infused in all of their classes because once you join AVID in seventh grade, we want to keep you in AVID until 12th grade. So we want you to understand what you are becoming a part of. In um, at um, BHS, ninth through 12th grade, we have 206 students. And Danielle and I, every year we get excited because that number continues to grow because our middle schools are doing a phenomenal job of recruiting students and they are staying from eighth to ninth grade um, with AVID. And then um, what's really exciting is at Boz, I always share, um, Boz does a phenomenal job with AVID. Um, it is embedded into all of their classes. If you did a walkthrough at Boz, you would see many of their classes run the, their model AVID classrooms. And 90% of the staff at Boz have all been trained in AVID strategies. Next slide. This is Dania. All right. Um, so this is the 2019 senior data. Um, and you'll see it last year, we had 25 seniors um, and we are a growing program. Um, one of the things, as Franny had said, um, we've been super lucky that, um, you know, whatever, you know, whatever those middle school teachers are doing, those kids don't want to exit AVID after the eighth grade. We get at least, I want to say 90% retention um, from eighth to ninth grade. And then of course, word has spread um, especially to parents, um, how great AVID is. And so typically we get a lot of applications throughout ninth and 10th grade as well. Um, so this year we have 40 seniors. Um, so we're nearly doubling our, um, we're getting close to doubling our, our retention with seniors. Um, we have some pretty cool, um, pretty cool numbers here from last year, 23 out of the 25 um, applied to a four-year college and 22 out of the 25 were accepted. Um, and I just have to point out, because sometimes you're like, what happened to those couple kids? You know, we're talking about military options or community co co college options as well, but all have a plan, that's for sure. Um, and I want to say, I looked something up too, that um, typically in the, you know, the last um, five or six years that I've been coordinating um, and the numbers I could find, we have like a 90% return rate of, of students accepted to a four-year college out of our seniors. So that's a pretty cool number, I think. We spend a lot of time um, during our senior year, we spend the, the first half of the year really um, hitting, the, hitting the road with, or hitting the ground running with um, applying to colleges. And then we spend a ton of time, um, I, I have to point this out, we spend so much time with our kids looking for funds. So finding scholarships and applying, and applying to places um, during our senior year elective. Um, and that's really a year where they come to, I mean, they've, they've already kind of formed that family um, bond and relationship, but they truly are one, one family by the senior year. Um, the other quick point I wanted to make is um, this last data point here about 17 out of the 25 seniors 
are taking rigorous courses. And we actually think 100% of our kids are taking rigorous courses because not all kids are, um, can take or want to take an AP or CIS class, which is how AVID defines rigor. We define rigor as what is rigorous for each kid. Um, so if we have an EL kid who might be taking um, a language arts class for the first time, a non-EL language arts class for the first time, that is rigorous for that kid. Um, and so we have 100% of our students are taking rigorous classes. Um, just um, AVID defines rigor um, with AP and CIS. The other piece um, in terms of if you're wondering about, because our numbers in 11th grader are like closer to 40 um, historically, we have a ton of kids um, who go full-time PSEO in between 11th and, you know, into 12th grade. And so they just don't have room in their schedule for AVID. So we do lose a few kids every year because of that, which is a bummer, but, but it's best for the kids. So, so they, they kind of stay with the family, but they don't take the course. So AVID school-wide recognitions that we have, Eagle Ridge Middle School is considered emerging school-wide, which means that there is evidence that AVID is beyond the elective class. And I should say that these school-wide recognitions are based on um, last year, every school was what AVID called held harmless. So you kept your rating from the year before. So I actually believe that Eagle Ridge would have moved into school-wide uh, school recognition, not emerging school-wide, but we were not turning in data last year because COVID happened right at March and data's due right at June and we were all trying to get through. So Burnsville High School is emerging school-wide, which is a um, phenomenal thing for the high school to be doing because it um, a high school is a big place and to move a whole high school to emerging school wide there is not a lot of high schools in minnesota who are at that same um, recognition status for avid so that is something unique for us and then Burnsville Alternative School is considered a certified site. And I have to, there should be an asterisk by this because I do say Burnsville Alternative School could technically be a um, avid demo site. And Amy is going to talk about that a bit more. One of the reasons that they're not a demo site is because the avid elective is woven into, they don't have a standalone elective class. It is woven into all of their classes. Um, but they, um, even our, everybody from avid national who I talk to and they come out and they see their data, they're like Burnsville High School, Alternative High School is a incredibly high performing avid site. So where we're going next with recognition, um, I think you've heard this, Eagle Ridge wants to go to national demo site, and then the high school wants to continue to be um, at um, after emerging school wide is another. It just it doesn't say emerging school wide. It just says avid school wide. And so we have goals that we have for each of the buildings. And Amy's going to talk to us about Nicolet. All right, so I will jump in um, and just give you a little background because Nicollet is a national demonstration school and our journey at Nicollet started in 2010 when the first group went to Summer Institute to kind of try out and see what it was all about. Um, Nicollet has worked extremely hard since then and has been recognized as one of only 203 national demonstration schools in the entire United States. We are one of only nine in the state of Minnesota that is a demonstration school. Um, it's important to note that we have been validated two times for this distinction. Uh, for, we were first validated in 2015 when we were Nicollet Junior High, um, and we were validated again in 2019 as Nicollet Middle School. Um, it's also important to know that it is a long process, like Franny had mentioned. It's, it's more than just the banner that hangs outside of Nicollet. Um, saying that we are a national demonstration school looks like the banner that's up there for you to see. Um, it is through a lot of teamwork, a lot of staff training, and a lot of hard work by our students and staff that AVID is able to see Nicollet as an exemplary model of AVID college readiness system. They recognize that we have implemented AVID with quality and fidelity 
And at NICLA, we are extremely proud of what we have accomplished and what we will continue to accomplish moving forward. So that is our last slide. Thank you for letting us present to you about AVID. Excellent. Thank you for your presentation. Before we proceed, I want to offer an apology to Ms. Christie and Ms. Smalley. When I was reading through the agenda and calling your, your speaking names, my, word, my mouth ran in front of my brain and I saw the, the school names next to it. I assumed you were students brought forth to speak on AVID. So I apologize. Uh, you're obviously highly competent staff members who are doing an excellent job. So I please accept my apologies. Is there any um, board members who would like to ask uh, questions this evening? Uh, Director Werb, I see your hand is raised. Why don't you please go ahead? Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say that um, uh, this is a, such a wonderful program and I had the opportunity last spring of volunteering to be a mentor for one of the AVID students at Nicollet Junior High um, through my work at Blue Cross. And I just want to say it was just such a wonderful experience getting to interact with one of those AVID students. Um, I had never heard of anything like that, this program before I, I volunteered to do it. And so um, having that interaction with the student and just getting to see the guidance they were getting and what they were getting out of this program um, was very exciting for me and knowing that this was in my own school district. <laughs> so um, very excited that we have this. I feel very proud to be a part of this um, and have it in our district. So. Uh, kudos to you guys for all the hard work and that we have the recognitions that we have. I just think it's it's awesome. Um, so just want to know, like, what kinds of things are you doing um, at Nicollet, um, at Eagle Ridge to get the students interested in AVID? Because um, I really, I do think it's, it's uh, a great benefit. And if we could get more students enrolled in it, um, that would be just awesome. So... Well, and I can speak for Nicola and Eagle Ridge right now is doing similar things. Obviously COVID has put a wrench in the works for all of us, but we continue to uh, find innovative and creative ways to reach out to our students. So um, having students make Flipgrid videos so that we can send it out to prospective students and have the students themselves tell what AVID has done for them and what they have learned through the AVID program. Um, we made videos that went out to like the elementary schools, to the fifth grade students to let them know about AVID and what it means and what it looks like at Nicollet Middle School with school-wide AVID. Um, and just continue to have opportunities where we've had our AVID elective students that are continuing it at Nicollet and Eagle Ridge um, to meet with the AVID tutors on a regular basis. I know Eagle Ridge is meeting once a week with their tutors and Nicollet is meeting twice a week with their tutors. And we have invited students to actually bring friends on board to come and try it out and see what it's about. Um, and at Nicollet, we do have a rolling application process. It used to be that there was a strict deadline every spring um, and we've implemented a rolling application process. So students can apply anytime throughout the year um, and we will interview them, go over their test scores and all the information and if they are a fit for AVID and we feel that they can be successful and we can help them move forward, then we start them at various times throughout the year. So I've had people, I've had kids starting literally almost every month so far since the beginning of the school year. That's that's great. Yeah. And I think um, it, it's our ninth graders that do that e-mentorship with the Blue Cross. Also, oh, it was probably okay. It was and, probably a ninth grader. <laughs> yeah, but the, we're starting again after after spring break. So if you can sign up again, you should. If if it's okay for me to do that as a board member, I would love to. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, Director Connor, you have your hand raised. And you're on mute. Mute. I realized I was muted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm also really... Um, um, really happy to see the um, percentage of kids that go on to college. That's really impressive. So that's really good to see. Um, also, I was just curious, um, is 
the AVID program, is it federally funded or is it just funded through the state or just through, with our school funds? Um, I can speak to that. Uh, we fund the AVID program through our achievement and integration funding from the state. Um, we consider AVID as one of our programs to promote equity, access, and reduce achievement uh, performance gaps. And so uh, we fund all of our AVID activities, or almost probably 95% of our AVID activities through the achievement and integration funding. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I really think it's a good program. I had the honor of being an AVID tutor last, well, not, not 2020, but 2019. And um, it was we did a lot of strenuous training, which was good. And um, I was really impressed with the kids. I, I do agree that the sixth graders are not, um, are doing preparedness instead of actually being in it. Thank you. Uh, and Director Alt. Thank you. Um, I, always, I always appreciate hearing about Avid. It's just, it's such an awesome program. And I remember actually, Ms. Christie, your class was classroom was one of the first that I visited when I was when I was first on on the board. And um, it's just awesome to go back into the schools and see how AVID is flourishing and the culture is changing and um, the students are doing different things now than they were years ago. And um, so it just it speaks volumes to the work that you and your, your colleagues are doing um, on behalf of our students. I do have one question um, about, you know, understanding that there are, you know, the field trips, the, the school visits and um, the lecturers that come in and, and share with, with the students. How have you been able to juggle that during the pandemic? And, and still have it be an authentic experience for the students. Well, luckily, Danielle, oh, I was gonna say, the high school does, um, we kind of do more of the college visits. And so luckily, um, I would say colleges and universities have really adapted more than we've had to adapt because what junior and senior gets to visit a school, you know, um, they're really tours are down, like tours there's, are non-existent. Um, and so they've really done a great job of of helping us be virtual in terms of, we just had an avid virtual college fair um, last week, February 18th, where um, all the schools or all the kids jumped on, but they were able to one-on-one -on -one talk to um, admission advisors, um, you know, and, and even from the big schools like the U of M, which was really cool because I don't think they would have had that face-to-face -face time, even if they had traveled over to the U to walk, to walk the campus. Because, you know, a lot of times, um, we really have valued our partnerships with schools. We have, um, we have, so we do eight tours throughout high school to a year. Um, and we have these great partnerships, but they've done a great job of um, adapting to make sure the kids still get a, what a college experience um, feels like through, through um, Zooms or meets and through, through um, videos, virtual tours as well. Yeah. I was just going to say at the middle school level, we've provided access through like the Schoology groups and things like that. So they're able to also connect into those schools and take the virtual tours and feel like they're on campus in some ways as well. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Director Saeed, you have your hand raised, please. Um, well, thank you, ladies, for um, giving us that great information. I think AVID is always going to be that one you know, interesting topic for all of us as school board members. Um, so I really do appreciate all the work you put in and giving that information to us. Um, I do have a few questions. I'll start with um, um, for the parents or community members or students that are watching, what is the process and in getting into AFID and how is that um, kind of presented to families in our community? Yes, I will take that one just because I start us out in the middle school level. But um, so, like I said, we've got uh, recruitment videos that we have made information that's been sent out. I know Dr. Pohl and I are working together, like I said, to get information from students so that students interested can see firsthand and hear firsthand from actual students how AVID has helped them. 
um, and what they have learned or grasped from the AVID program and AVID school wide. Um, when students are interested, there is um, an online application form that students complete um, and their parents help them complete parts of it. And then that application comes to us um, and I have a giant spreadsheet <laughs> um, that is loads of information about the students. So we gather information about um, attendance, test scores, um, we get letters of recommendation from teachers. We, it's just tons of information that we gather. Uh, we also then interview students. We have a set uh, procedure that we go through that all AVID schools go through um, in interviewing the students. And then we have the AVID site team that comes together and then reviews all of the applications and determines, you know, do our demographics in AVID match the demographics of the school? Do we have um, gender balance? Does that match the balance of the school? Do we have students that are in the middle academically, like what AVID strives to see? So we're not, um, we're not getting all just honors kids and we're not getting students that are struggling so much that they need that extra help before the AVID program would really be the best help for them. We really look and strive to go through all of that and find those students that are going to be successful. Because the last thing we want to do um, is set a student up that's eager for it and set them up for frustration. Um, and so if we do sometimes have to tell students that, you know what, AVID's not a good fit for you, we always say yet. Um, and I know at Nicollet, we talk to the students about what it is, what goals they could set for themselves and what it is that they could do um, to try to improve, whether it be attendance or um, behavior issues or whatever it might be, things that they can work on and strive to do so that they could be part of the AVID program in the future. And I will say I had students that applied in sixth, seventh grade that this year in eighth grade are on board and grades are up and attendance is up. And it's just really exciting to see because they had that goal that they wanted to work for. Um, I'm just gonna <laughs> piggyback on Amy really quickly. What, um, for the high school, the culture has already kind of been determined or is, has already developed in terms of who the AVID student is. And so we really take that AVID stands for Advancement Via Individual Determination. We, I mean, it's really the individual determination in the high school because that's gonna, that's going to be the determiner of whether or not a student's successful in the AVID program. It's, it's do they want to be there, um, and um, you know, are they committed to um, a college going future? So that's that's more of the Amy's laid the groundwork in the middle school, or the middle school teachers have laid the groundwork for. Um, kind of that high, um, you know, just just high expectations and just, you know, that the, we really say, okay, but do you, you know, do you want to be here? Um, so. And just to include on that, Danielle, the very first question on the AVID interview when we sit down with students, um, usually it's one-on-one, -on -one, but it's been virtual. Uh, when we sit down with students, the very, very first question is, what do you know about the AVID program and why did you choose to apply? And we very much want to hear that they are motivated and they want to do it, not that a parent is telling them they have to or that their older sister did it so they have to do it. Um, we really want to hear that students, even at the middle school level, are determined and have that drive and that goal because it is extra work. It is extra work above and beyond what students do every day in the classrooms. Um, and they have to really want and see those goals and those dreams and want to work towards it. Thank you for that, Amy. Um, some of the things that you mentioned that could possibly um, prevent a student from enrolling um, was you mentioned the attendance piece, behavior. Um, so many of these students from, I guess, from what I've read can reapply anytime during their, their school, uh, school term. Um, is income um, one thing that is ma majority of the time looked at? Um, for, for them to be enrolled? Um, income is not at all part of the actual application process. Uh, we do look to see, parents do mark on the application whether they're free and reduced lunch. And again, we look to see at that data point to see if we are, again, in the academic middle and we're matching what the demographics are for the school. Just that's another data point to check because really an AVID elective class in a building should match the demographics of that building. All right. Um, does, um, 
does being an AFID prevent a student from um, being in or advanced placement classes? Quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so, so someone kind of, who invests in the advanced classes can be do, um, an AVID also. That's actually the bridge that we're talking about. So the goal, that last data point I had for the seniors is how many kids were taking rigorous courses. The goal, you know, back when we started, we said we want everybody to take an AP or CIS course by like the 10th or 11th grade. Um, we realize that's probably not a realistic goal for some of our kids. So now we just, we say we are the bridge. Um, hopefully in whatever um, class a student might be interested in taking a rigorous class, we're the bridge that hopefully will, um, will help seal, um, seal any, you know, any confusion for a student because they bring those points of confusion back from their rigorous classes to tutorials. Um, so it's encouraged that they take high, um, rigorous classes. All right. Um, do you find it that um, sometimes it's really hard for students who are who fall in the middle to um, to kind of grasp if I'm not sure you cut out on, you cut out a little bit for me. I don't know if you did for everybody or not. I didn't quite hear the question. The great thing um, is for students who are in the middle if um, and they're an avid elective student, our teachers, all our teachers are amazing and they know that this student is determined to take this class and be successful. And one of the things that AVID does is it empowers students to go get help from your teacher, but also bring your points of confusion. So everybody wants that student to be successful in the bridge, um, not just the AVID elective teacher, but the teacher from the advanced placement course to the student. And it's all of them working together that can help the student get through that process. And I think like Franny said too, it's important that AVID refers to the AVID elective and everybody together as an AVID family. So the kids know through a lot of those team building and trust building uh, different things that we do throughout the year that they can rely on the people around them and the teachers around them and the tutors around them for help and support. And we have each other's backs when things get tough. And we teach students to self-advocate and to, you know, like if you're having trouble in a content area, what is it that you choose to do? And, and you know, teaching them all the different options that they can do and places that they can go to help. Because I would also add, oh, I'm sorry, Amy. Oh, I was just gonna say, because we're not always going to be there to help. So again, our goal is to get them to have the tools that they need moving forward to be successful. As far as staff training goes, I would say when we first started AVID, one of the barriers um, that every new AVID school has is um, how are we going to um, make sure there's a shift in an AP or honors or CIS teacher's mind that it's not just the top um, Pogat or like whatever these test scores, but not just the top 40 test scores in my class that all, you know, any student, um, any student can, um, can, can try in a rigorous class. And I feel like at the high school, and I know it, I know for sure at Nicollet and Eagle Ridge, the shift has happened in, in um, rigorous teacher, rigorous classroom teachers had minds um, that, you know, um, you know, any, any kid can, can, can be successful in my class. You don't have to have the top 40 test scores. So it's been a shift. Um, Dave Helke supported that shift too at the high school by having um, open enrollment. So now we don't just rely on test scores for honors classes. Um, it's self-selected. Honors classes are self-selected at the high school. So, you know, if a student um, decides in ninth grade, I'm going to take honors um, English. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to marry that with an AVID class. Um, that would be a perfect opportunity for that first year in an honors class. That's great. Thank you, ladies. Um, one more question. Uh, if uh, Danny, and um, this might be a question for more of Danielle. So if a student does not um, find out about AFID during their junior high school years, can they join when they are in high school or do they have to start in sixth grade? Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, we have open. So um, on the AVID, um, on the AVID section of our school website, there's also an open application and we okay. roll it, we do rolling too. So we actually do per semester. Um, we've kind of paused during um, COVID just because um, 
some students have a lot of, you know, it's just like, we felt like, okay, well, let's get back to our routines. Um, but, but we're putting kids fresh into AVID for this next fall. Um, and right now we have 25 kids who will be new from the high school into a 9, 10 or 11th grade. We don't put new kids into 12th grade because by that time um, you've, you've really had to develop the habits of AVID to, to, to get the, um, the payout of 12th grade. But, um, but yeah, we, we've got kids applying all the time. Um, and what's great is the culture at the high school is an appreciation of the AVID elective class because our, our teachers really have, through our PD, every PD seems to be somewhat AVID um, centered. Um, so teachers appreciate AVID um, as they learn more AVID strategies to use in their content classes. They're recognizing like students who might thrive in AVID. And so a lot of times we get AVID kids because a teacher's recommended them. Um, not, not necessarily the kid, but the, te the teacher will say, hey, um, you know, um, Amy really it would would really do well in AVID and I think it'd be really great for her. So we have a lot of advocates at, at Burnsville High School and I know, know the middle schools do as well. That's great. I also wanna make sure that it's clear that students who are new to the district, mm -hmm. if they transfer to um, one of our schools and they have been in AVID at their other school, we try to make a place for them in AVID as well, um, making sure that 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 the work that they've already put into being avid at another school is continues to pay off for them. Yep. And I, I think the thing we didn't mention too, just to students, when they agree to the avid elective, sign a contract and they are held to a higher standard of where we need their grades to be, where we need their attendance to be, all of those things. And again, they've got that support network of guidance counselors, teachers, everybody that's there rooting them on and supporting them, but we definitely are there to hold them up if they fall. All right, thank you. I uh, do not see any other hands raised, so I will once again thank you all for an excellent presentation and the, the work you're doing uh, to benefit our kiddos, are really, we all really appreciate it. Thank you very much. We will now move to a report about Regulation 602, Organization of the School Calendar and School Day. Presenting will be our Assistant Superintendent, Brian Gersich. Brian, microphone is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Board of Directors and Superintendent Battle. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, part of me right now is wondering why I drew the wonderful opportunity to follow this amazing presentation about AVID and visuals in our kids about a re regulation of how we create a school calendar. Um, so I, I feel like uh, this wasn't quite uh, stacked in my favor here, but that's all right. Uh, this is a, a process to talk you through a little bit about how we create the school calendar. Uh, this fall, the school board did approve the school calendars for the years 2022 through 2024. I think as a result of that process, uh, I believe it was then Chair Alt who said it, it would be helpful to capture this process in writing. Um, what I'm about to present to you is kind of what that process looks like. I will say the majority of this is uh, what I understood the process to be, this being my first time helping facilitate the development of the calendar. So I want to acknowledge there's a lot of things that have been in place for a lot of years. I wouldn't be able to tell you necessarily what's different because of the fact that it's, it's my first time through. Uh, but the document there, again, is to kind of outline the procedures. Because this is not a policy, it does not require the board approval, but as this was presented to the policy committee because it is directly related to policy, we believed it was helpful, or I should say the committee believed it was helpful to bring that forward to the entire board just so that you knew that it was there. So again, in that document, you'll notice initially a statement of purpose, which I kind of outlined for you, which is to capture uh, the process, followed by the actual procedures themselves. Our procedures, as you may recall, we started by outlining what are our parameters. Those are the must do's. So that would be things that are in policy, in law, or in our collectively bargained agreements that we have to adhere to. And so again, things in there might include the number of work days for teachers, the number of student contact days, et cetera. These are kind of, the, again, the rules, the must do's. After that, you'll notice what's called the preferences. These are kind of things that based on past practice that we try and attempt to uh, year over year. Again, those would be things like how we take our non-student days as K-12 for the benefit of our families. 
again, these can change over time. Uh, and you know that just becomes again, a new past practice as we go through those. After that, we try to capture the development process. So you'll see how those process or how those different versions are developed of potential school calendars. Uh, always wanna make sure I acknowledge Wendy Drugi, who's the president of our Burnsville Education Association. She's a great partner as we go through and does a lot of the work of actually putting some of the ideas into the actual calendars themselves. You know, always appreciate Wendy and, and her time with that. And then you'll notice the second item under that, and I think this is a part that the board also was appreciative of and wants to make sure is captured, is that feedback loop. How do we get information from exec leadership team to all of our bargaining units, our cultural liaisons, our CISA team, to make sure that multiple eyes are on the different versions and we continue that feedback loop until we've resolved our calendar issues that is going to come before the school board for official approval. Uh, within that approval, you'll notice it also mentions that by policy, a calendar has to come by November of the previous school year. In past practice, the school board has an opportunity to approve a couple of calendars at a time well in advance so that we can establish those things um, down the road. So again, that's just a very brief description of the, the process that we go through. Uh, again, this is a regulation. It doesn't need uh, board approval, but that way you at least understand what it looks like so that if it appears as a little snippet in the um, uh, board policies that are online, you'll know what it is, how it was created and, and where it came from. So again, thank you very much. I will um, turn this back to Chair Miller to determine next steps if there's uh, feedback or questions. Any comments or uh, questions for Mr. Gersich? All right, I see, whoops. Director all you will raise your hand. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair Miller. Um, yes, I wanted to, to thank um, Brian for um, pulling this together. Um, it really, it, I really appreciate seeing that, um, you know, our, our practice is documented, knowing that they're going to change over time, but at least that, you know, that record is there um, to be reviewed and assessed and determined if it still works for us or not. Um, and uh, that feedback loop for me particularly is, is really important. I, I really appreciated knowing, you know, the different iterations and the, and, and how the different groups do have that that input um, so that we as a board can feel assured that this really is serving um, the best interests of, of our students and our staff. Okay, uh, Director Connor, you have your hand raised. Yes, I was just wondering, is it going to be an actual calendar or just kind of a piece of paper? Yeah, so this in and of itself is just going to be, I mean, to, to your point, it's a piece of paper. Like what, what this is, is really just to outline so that as future calendars are created, or if this gets delegated to somebody else, or, you know, in the post Brian Gersich era, there's at least some record of how do we go about creating the calendars. The calendars themselves were approved, I believe in November, but it was sometime this fall before the first of the year. So we now have the current school year and three more school year calendars. So it's probably another, you know, two-ish years from now before we would actually bring forward to this board uh, additional calendars for consideration. Thank you. Sure. We just refer to that as BG and AG. So any other uh, questions or comments for Mr. Rushish this evening? All right, seeing none, thank you for your time this evening on this. You're not done, but thank you for the moment. Um, now we will move on to receive an update about District 191's efforts to implement COVID-19 related educational and public health guidance issued by the MDE and the MDH respectively. Presenting Dr. Teresa Battle, our superintendent. Dr. Battle, microphone is yours. Thank you, Chair Miller, directors of the board. Tonight, uh, we'll share information related to health and safety, secondary learning model update, activities and operations. Um, regarding health and safety, today, Minnesota Department of Health um, released the data for county confirmed cases um, from the time 214 to 227. Dakota County has 24.96, which is an increase from 23.22. 
and Scott County is 25.60, um, a decrease from 27.76. Um, please note per, uh, previously we had the recommended policy options um, based on those numbers, whether you would be distance or hybrid or in-person, but per Governor Walsh's announcement on um, February 17th, the county level data alone does not impact the need for a transition to a more restrictive learning model. Instead, we should rely on our school level COVID-19 transmission data and um, staff capacity when making a decision to transition to learning models. Uh, Bernie Bean will join me, our lead school nurse, and she will share an analysis of county data and our local 191 data and she will also share an update regarding uh, activities guidance related to uh, confirmed cases of the variant in Eastern Carver County. Bernie. Thank you, Dr. Battle, Board of Directors and Chair Miller. Um, like Dr. Battle said, I'm gonna give you some metric points from the county, our local counties, and also our internal data, but also share a little bit more information with you about um, the recent press release for Carver County. Um, next week, the 14-day projected report um, number for Scott County and Dakota County should be slightly around the 25. Um, so a little higher, a little lower, but that's what they're predicting for next week. The positivity rate for Scott County and Dakota County is 4.7. In Dakota County, the seven-day average cases of positive COVID individuals reported over the last three weeks has kind of hovered between that 70 to 80 um, individuals. They have, they, what they have found though in the last week is those repositive cases predominantly have been in the five to 19 year olds and the 40 to 49 year, year olds. Last week, it was just the five to 19 year olds. So this week they've added another age group into that. As far as our long-term care facilities, this week they did have three positive cases. However, the past two weeks they had none. And so they still feel that that is, show some success with the vaccinations that were um, targeted with those, those individuals initially. Um, one of the exciting points for Dakota County is that out of their residents, 17.3% have completed one dose of the vaccination and 9.1% 9, 9 have completed the series. That means that more people have completed the series than they have positive cumulative cases in Dakota County. So that's kind of a milestone metric number for them that they're, they're excited about. Internally, for that 14 day period, which was February 14th to February 27th, we, um, well, we had only two non-staff individuals that we did case reporting for, case tracing for. Um, as of January, February 1st, when we started in person, we still have had zero staff members that have tested positive for COVID that we've had to do any case tracing for. Um, for our students during that time frame, we had under five. I, I, I believe the number was actually three. Um, so we are doing well. Um, but as today, many, some of you may not know this, but it is the one year anniversary from when COVID was officially declared a pandemic. As a country, as a nation, we have learned a lot about COVID, but there still is much that we do not know. It really is showing a lot of mystery yet. Uh, and one of those is seen in the recent press release for the weekend for Carver County. That press release was issued by the Minnesota Department of Health due to a cluster of B117 COVID variant that was um, identified in the community. That variant is the UK variant. The reasons MDH um, list for doing the press release 
is because of the potential of the rapid spread. Most of these cases were among the youth in Carver County. And the households that those youth lived in had a rapid spread. The other reason was the potential for severe illness with this variant and the potential for rapid geographic spread. In a sense, we have a little race with time. We want to um, increase vaccination rates and, and decrease the spread until we get to that rate that will be um, better at curbing the effects of COVID. Internally, health and safety for District 191 has been a priority. And, you know, we could not do that without the support of the community and the staff and the students and, and the whole district as a whole. Um, but when I put on my public health lens, we still have a ways to go. MDH echoes that we still need to stay vigilant. COVID is, COVID is there and the mysteries of COVID become evident when we don't want them to become evident. And we, as a district, we will continue to focus on that health and safety, keeping our community safe and fighting COVID. Thank you. And before we go to our uh, presentation, I wanted to share a little bit about plans for our wonderful seniors, the class of 2021. Um, as you know, we've been getting questions about graduation and prom and other senior class activities. So we are still awaiting uh, Minnesota Department of Health updated guidance um, for large group gatherings. So the current guidance is under venue guidance, V-E-N-U-E. Um, and um, since we haven't had that information updated, we've been planning for uh, different scenarios for graduation prom and other activities. So we haven't made any decisions yet regarding these events for Burnsville High School or BOS. And high school administration is being very proactive um, and planning alternatives to uh, what we would deem as normal prom graduation. Uh, we still want our students to have fun. We want it to be meaningful to them, um, but ultimately they must be safe. And so we will continue to monitor uh, state and um, local health guidance and principals uh, Helke and Ron will be communicating to seniors and their families. And so with that, uh, Aaron, will you, um, share the presentation. I think I'm going to turn it over to Brian Gersich again, and he'll go through the agenda and he'll give you an update on uh, plans for in-person um, learning for secondary schools. Um, and then Lisa Ryder will give some updates um, and then you'll see Bernie again to share about vaccine program and mitigations. Brian. Thank you, uh, Dr. Battle, and thank you again for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing to prepare for, uh, once again, some of our shifted in learning models. Uh, next slide, please, Aaron. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit and really focus tonight on the secondary learning plan transitions uh, before, again, other presenters, including Bernie and uh, Lisa, as Dr. Battle had mentioned, talk about mitigation uh, strategy updates and some of the operational updates. Next slide, please. Uh, so what I do want to talk about, we did uh, on March 1st, we had our middle school and high schools welcome our students back to grades 6 through 12 um, into our hybrid learning model. In previous presentations that we've done for the board, we really did focus on the fact that elementary was transitioning back in. They had made that in early in, in mid-February. The unique thing about those two transitions is that the elementary did require the rolling start as MDE talked about it, so only three grade sets at a time. We were able to bring in all of our students 612 without that rolling start. I'm very glad we got the opportunity to do that. Uh, in visiting sites, visiting with principals and seeing what was going on, it was extremely successful. Uh, and hats off to the teams at our middle schools and high schools. Um, it really was a very positive transition and students very quickly remembered our safety routines and procedures for hybrid learning. So just an impressive 
return to learning. And I'm, again, I'm glad that we didn't have to have sets of grades waiting for that opportunity to come back into the buildings. Uh, and then we did, of course, immediately start planning for that potential for return to in-person. Now that we're in the middle and hybrid, we really know that the two directions are COVID cases tell us we need to go back in the direction of distant learning, which are plans we have because we've made that shift before, or the shift to more in-person, which is where we needed to continue some of that development. Uh, before I jump to the next slide, the one thing I wanna note is that when I'm referring to high school this evening with this presentation, I am talking about Burnsville High School. Burnsville Alternative High School, Boz, actually already has, because of their smaller size, they can allow their students to come back in person four days a week without be alternating A day, B day, because they can keep six feet apart, keep all of the parameters without having to do that. So just so you realize, not ignoring Boz, but they're already a little bit ahead of where everybody else is because of the size of the student population that we're able to offer. Uh, Aaron, next slide. Uh, I just bring this up. This is something that I presented to the board in January when we talked about what was our process like to make sure you realize what I'm talking about tonight is the bottom of our decision-making framework. What happens with implementation? Uh, it is not, and it hasn't been the, the, the role of the group that I'm helping to facilitate to say, should we? You know, that's part of stakeholder voice and options at the top. And the decision maker in this is Dr. Battle and the Board of Education that has given her the authority to make those decisions. We've tried to set that aside as part of our planning. And what we're talking about here is, if the decision is made, to further move to in-person, this is the process we're using to be ready to implement. And again, all the way through, uh, I believe our team has done a really good job of making sure that they are ready. So our transitions in and out of learning models for, for all practical purposes have been really positive and fairly seamless. Uh, next slide, please. So we do have a team that has met multiple times already, I believe three or four meetings, just to talk about this idea of transitioning secondary to in-person learning. You know, a dozen meetings, we've got our 13th scheduled for a couple of weeks from now. We had our 12th meeting this morning uh, to go through and talk about these changes. As discussed before, we've been working on pre-flight checklists. Those are everything we can do now to prepare for that shift in learning models. The dependent items, that's us developing lists with our partners in various departments to make sure that if one person is waiting for a task before they can complete theirs, we're working together backwards map with timelines and improve communication to do that. In-flight checklist, that's that transition time. When the decision's been made, what needs to be done to get students in person and learning? In this situation, an example of an in-flight item would be adding more desks to classrooms because we're gonna increase the number of students in a room. That has to wait until we're ready to go because we're still learning hybrid right now. It's a different setup and we'll talk about those parameters when I get to uh, the next slide. Right now, what we're doing for planning is targeting the week of April 12 as when we would consider coming back. Now, I want to make it really clear that's not an announcement. We're not determining April 12 is when it's going to happen. This is a part of our planning process. That date was picked um, because it looks, it looks as if it will be the start of fourth quarter. It is a couple weeks into uh, the post uh, spring break. Uh, which certainly, again, I know that there's some cautionary tales about potential traveler things and spread of COVID during that time. And so, again, similar to past targets, we use this for planning purposes to backwards map and make sure we're ready. Dr. Battle, the COVID advisory team that she has, and COVID in, in particular, will determine whether or not that's realistic. When we talk about transitioning, there are two days expected by the state to transition in learning models. So as we look at a week, when we make that determination, that group would recommend we take Monday and Tuesday as transition days. So that would mean no student instruction. Wednesday as our typical distant learning day, I'll talk about that in a minute, with students coming back into the building on a Thursday. That would also give us five consecutive non-student days for potential shifts in uh, desks and moving furniture around uh, as a part of that transition. Uh, next slide, please. These are some of the parameters. Uh, and so again, this was put to us by the Department of Education that students, wherever we can, continue to maintain the six feet. But knowing that if we're bringing students in four days a week, we need to move those desks potentially closer together to fit more into the room. Three feet is the minimum. Now, six feet continues to be the minimum distance between our students and our adults or adult to adult. Uh, if cases fell below 10 per 10,000, 
we would be able to move, uh, remove those distance requirements and just allow students to uh, be closer than the three feet current minimum that we would structure things. What we've continued to stress with our team is that we've got to be prepared in our models for a potential rapid shift to distant learning. Um, the thing about that is, even though the state has said we can move desks closer together, you know, the work of Bernie, her nurses, and the team has not changed. A close contact is still considered under six feet. So as you can imagine, we are designing theoretically here a system that will automatically have close contacts. Right now, if one of our schools, if, if X middle school had a student who was a positive case and all of our parameters were being followed, Theoretically, that student shouldn't have any close contacts because all of our students are more than three feet apart, wearing a mask, social distancing, all of those things are in place. In theory, if we put those closer together and students are within three feet, a student with a positive case in a classroom is going to have at least theoretically three close contacts and maybe as many as eight. And again, if you, if you have the same kind of screen in front of me and just imagine the number of people, the top left corner has at least three people around them, the person right in the middle has somebody on all sides. So again, you can see how that could work. And at a high school situation, when kids go class to class, amplify that times four class periods, five class periods in a given day, you can see there's some complexities to that. So we do have to be ready for a potential shift if we have a lot of close contacts that results in us needing to quarantine or close the school. You've probably read the news. There are elementary schools right now that have had to do that uh, in some of our neighboring districts. Uh, likely need to maintain Wednesday as a distance learning day. Part of that is still we're under the executive order that requires uh, additional prep time uh, for teachers that are teaching both uh, hybrid and in-person, which is a lot of our setup because of the virtual academy and singleton courses, as well as right now at our middle school, the way we've designed our pods, that's how students are also getting uh, instruction from specials teachers. And so part of our structure would still in this model have a Wednesday as a distant learning day. And then I just like to mention some of the complexities we've dealt with. It seems when we change learning models, there's a volume of requests and, and you may recall this from uh, when we shifted to in-person learning after the, the new year, number of students who say that that doesn't fit and they may change and go one direction or another than those requests. Certainly that creates staffing complexities, relationship and continuity in instruction complexities. That has been something that we've been really trying to work to mitigate uh, and hope it doesn't, it doesn't change a whole lot as we shift some of these models, because uh, that is a, a complex change. And I think those are my slides and I will hand it, I believe, to Bernie. So since February 1st, um, the elementary schools have been conducting saliva screening. March 1st marked the first time that our secondary drool teams joined our operation. And that went really well. Our next um, screening date is March 15th, so coming up in, on Monday. Um, after that, it would be on March 29th, but because that is spring break, MDE has um, provided us with a waiver that we can provide that screening to our staff on April 5th, so the first day back from spring break. As far as vaccination, I mean, exciting. More and more vaccines are becoming available for the community. Um, from the best of our knowledge, every employee has received at least one, if not two, invitations to sign up for a COVID vaccination. Right now, we are working with our local um, partners with vaccination to um, work on a program for our, our employees that are in that 16 to 18 year old age group. Um, there is only one vaccine that's licensed for their age group and um, very few, that's the Pfizer, and very few sites have Pfizer. So we're working with some local partners to try to find some resources for that age group in our community so we can offer them the vaccination also since they work with our students. Um, I am going to turn it over with to Lisa right now, Lisa Ryder. Thank you. I just wanted to add for you this evening, the operational lens has just a need for us to make sure that our community understands and knows that March 3rd was the last date of distribution of meals at Sioux Trail Elementary School, but they can always pick up their meals um, at the Eagle Ridge Middle School or Nicollet Middle School on Wednesdays between 11 and 12.30 p.m. 
that's um, currently still in the works. And so we just wanted to make sure our community understood that. Thank you. And that concludes our report tonight for our COVID-19 implementation. Okay, thank you. Uh, board members, I'll ask if there's any questions or comments to be made. Director Alt. Thank you. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, on the testing, um, am I correct, understanding you correctly um, in terms of the testing of staff that our, um, you know, the positivity rate or testing rate is based not on the staff that we ourselves have tested, but in total who have been tested, or is it limited, limited just to, you know, our rates are limited just to those staff that we have tested in the district? The, the positivity rate for Scott County and Dakota County are based on county data. We, um, if we did have a positive that showed up in our saliva screening, that would be counted in a county data. We have nothing to do with that information. So when I give a, a number to say that we had zero staff um, that reported a positive COVID case to us, that's them reporting to us or MDH reporting to us. So that would be exhaustive. Pardon me? That would be an exhaustive report. It would be a complete report. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, and then also to speak clear, there was no, I mean, it, no clear statement on the activity, on any change in activities. Am I understanding that at this point in time, there is no recommendation to change um, how activities um, are proceeding? Yep. Oh. Oh, yes, yeah. so uh, we, we do have our COVID activities team that continues to meet on a regular basis. Uh, the most recent guidance, at least that we saw, anything specific was really more recently related to Carver County as they had a new variant outbreak and were given some recommendations about their use boards. For everyone else, there's been those recommendations to continue to uh, strictly enforce the regulations that were already there. I, I will again speak volumes of our coaches, advisors, and our team. We've been strict from the beginning and made some things clear from the beginning that we needed to ensure that, you know, we were willing to spin dials for, which means increase or decrease levels uh, of requirement for different groups, just based on our ability to make sure we're adhering to that. So we feel pretty good that we didn't need to be more strict because we've been really careful from the beginning. That's great, thank you. Okay, any... Uh... Any more comments or questions? I'll just um, mention that uh, and some of you may have heard at the end of the day here in the media that uh, Governor Walls is planning a, what they're toting is a fairly significant announcement tomorrow about dial moving. So I believe one of the articles I read this evening was that uh, it was uh, talk about, um, specifically talk about proms and such and getting back to he said something like it'll be should look like normal. So we'll see. So stay tuned. All right. Next um, at the end of that, we will move to the uh, student representative report section of our evening. Uh, our student representative, uh, Milka May Adesu, uh, you may come off mute and give your presentation if you'd like, please. Hello, board. In the last few days of Black History Month, the Black Student Union put together a video to celebrate all of the amazing influences that should be represented during the month. Many students read poems, made speeches, and created songs and raps of their own. Students were able to watch this well put together video in their advisories. Another student-led event that has taken place at BHS is the Student Council's plans to volunteer at Feed My Starving Children. The executive board, Mr. Riggs and I, have coordinated slots where students can participate just two days ago. 
We also discussed the matters of pomp. We have um, been working alongside staff regarding the possible event and only tentative plans have been discussed. But just as Dr. Battle said, we are still awaiting to hear from officials to put any proposal of the event in motion. That is it for my report. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Battle, uh, superintendent report. Yes, thank you, Chair Miller, members of the board. Um, tonight, I wanna take just a couple of moments to share um, information about some items we should celebrate. First, we know how challenging this year has been for our students participating in athletics or activities, but I'm very happy um, that we've been able to provide some opportunities for students despite restrictions of, uh, because of the pandemic. Um, we have some wonderful successes by students recently. We have two skiers, ninth grader Kaylin Ambul in Nordic skiing and junior Forrest Bowman in Alpine qualified for this year's state meets. And our Burnsville High School Quiz Bowl team won the state championship just last weekend. Um, for those who do not know, our high school and middle school quiz bowl teams have had wonderful success under the direction of Les Moffitt, uh, qualifying for nationals for several years. This is the first team state championship though, and they had to beat three-time defending champions YZ to do it. Um, there are still other activities going on now and more to come this spring. Um, as we have in the past, board members, um, you know, we do take some time at a board meeting to recognize um, outstanding achievements. And so I just wanted to mention these now, and I hope um, that uh, because it means so much for our families, um, and their students to have these opportunities to compete and perform. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention an article that's in the Sun this week, right now. Um, it recognizes Bus Driver Appreciation Week taking place, it took place at the end of February. And our bus company, Smitty and Sons, took the time to honor Peggy Garb and Eileen Donnelly. And I want to recognize them also tonight. Peggy as a driver and Eileen as a bus aide have each been making sure our students get to school and home safely for more than 40 years. Thank you so much to Peggy and Eileen for your service to our students. It really does make a big difference in their lives and it provides comfort and peace to parents. Um, that concludes my report for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Uh, we will move to the board member reports section of tonight. Um, just reminding everybody that uh, we, we rotate every other board meeting for the nature of the reports given. So tonight's reports are not committee reports, but rather individual events and um, actions that may have occurred and you would like to give report on. So saying such, uh, any board members have anything to report? Okay, I don't see any. Now, having said that, I'm gonna make an executive decision and violate what I just said and ask uh, Director Chester to come forward to, because the legislative committee did meet on um, Monday or Tuesday evening, uh, Tuesday, and does have some rather time sensitive uh, information for us to hear this evening. So Director Chester, it is your microphone. Great, thank you, Chair Miller. I understand my internet connection is a little variable. So let me know if I cut out. Um, but yes, the legislative committee did meet on Tuesday and there's been uh, much activity as um, we as a district are interested in um, having a bill go forward with our legislature to the, to the Capitol to being allowing an exemption in terms of any future sale of our open facilities. And so um, the board, 191 board of directors and staff met with Minnesota legislators to request a sponsor for special legislation to allow the use of proceeds from the state of various closed facilities under the district's open facilities action plan that was approved at our October 22nd board meeting to be deposited into the district's unrestricted general fund to the extent allowed under federal tax law. And when we did meet, um, um, 
with our legislators, Legislators Representative Jessica Hansen, Senator Greg Clausen, and Senator Lindsey Port, met with myself, um, Chair Miller, Superintendent Battle, Executive Director of Business Services, Lisa Ryder, Martha Ingram, and Sophia Like from Kennedy Graven and Jeff Seeley from Ellers. And from as a result of that meeting, Senator Clausen and Representative Hansen shared they would sponsor the bill and the next step was for the draft bill to be sent to the E-12 Education Fiscal Analyst for review and then to the Minnesota Legislative Revisors Office. From the legislative analysts, typically bills like this require a fiscal note to ident identify a potential levy impact and tracked by the Education Finance Committee. And as of tomorrow, the that is the deadline for any bills to be presented. So we are hopeful that um, everything will be moving forward uh, with the with the reviser um, and any edits that have transpired with the draft bill that has been drafted, so that um, we can be proceeding with this with our bill, and that one of the outcomes is that staff will be um, able to testify at committee hearings uh, once the bill has been submitted. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Director Chester. Um, I know that uh, there has been some um, discussion around uh, the nature of um, this process. I just want to clarify that um, the, our legislative peers have been very clear that um, they needed to get this bill in uh, pronto. Uh, in fact, I think we have uh, been given a few favors that uh, they ran through the process pretty quick. So we appreciate that. Um, the bill is uh, as written um, and can be, uh, just to be clear, the, the, there's a draft, it's in front of them now, it's probably going to change in some places, not too um, significantly, I would want to think, but, uh, and there might there will probably be an opportunity for some of us to uh, testify to answer some questions. But um, as far as the uh, dispersal of the funds, uh, they were fairly clear, it's as written, it should just strictly go to the general fund we as a board will have an opportunity to, and we're planning, I'm planning on making this opportunity available soon, have a conversation about the actual end use of those funds, but it goes to the general fund and then it can go from there if we uh, choose to put it somewhere and say in a restrictive fund for other development and such, but we will have those conversations in the future. Uh, Director Connery, you had your hand raised, I believe. Yeah, I just wondered, is it my understanding that um, since I did give a report on AMSD, um, last our last meeting, even though they had a meeting on March 5th, that I do not need to give a report this time? Correct. Uh, as that is a committee assignment, um, the, we'll take committee assignments at our next regular meeting on, I believe, the 25th of uh, March. Okay, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, no worries. Okay, with that, we wrap up the informational section of our evening tonight, and we will now move to the business meeting, beginning with our consent agenda. Although board action is required, it is generally unnecessary to hold decision on these items. In the event a board member wishes to discuss an item, that item will be moved for separate consideration. This time I'd like to ask if any board members um, desire to have uh, an item moved off the consent agenda for separate consideration. All right, seeing no requests for such, um, I will uh, ask for a motion then for the approval of tonight's consent agenda. So, so moved. moved. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I'll so second. moved by Director <laughs> Hume and seconded by Director Chester. Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Chester? Aye. Connor? Aye. Hume? Aye. Miller? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Werb? Aye. Alt? Aye. Motion for approval of the consent agenda passes unanimously. We'll now move to the new business section of our evening. Um, and that is the first item tonight is to approve selection of auditor. Presenting will be Lisa Ryder, Executive Director of Business Services. Ms. Ryder, you have the microphone. Thank you and good, good evening. So um, as we look at this item before you tonight, we are talking about our services provided by our auditing firm. 
And that would be for this current year's audit of our financial information, which would take place this fall. Uh, well, actually it starts in the summer, but it continues then in, with a report to you in the fall and winter of next year. As a little bit of history, we've been with our Clifton Larson Ellen firm as they began auditing back in 2009-2010 fiscal year. And prior to that, we were with Malloy Montag Karnowski Radozovic and Company, which is also known as MMKR for 30 years, or almost 30 years, I should say, um, prior to that. So for this, this year's financial statement audit, we conducted a request for proposals. So what that means, means is that we uh, send out the request proposals to interested parties. And from that, then we receive those proposals and we have a process then to assess those proposals and bring forward a recommendation for the board to approve. So this is a professional service. This process isn't necessarily required, but it is something that districts often do so that they can just assess kind of the um, comparability of, of the services they've been receiving as to what they might be receiving. As a part of the board um, packet is an attachment that is a two page summary of everything that was done in our process. We began this back in December of 2020 by putting a, um, publishing in the newspaper the fact that we were going out for a request for proposal. And at that same time, then we listed and sent out our request for proposal to uh, 14 different firms. Of those 14, six firms responded with a proposal that was due to us on January 12th. And then on February 5th, uh, we notified firms that due to a, a resignation as our finance director at that time, that we were going to need to extend our time to get back to them from February 12th to March 15th. So we did that offering the opportunity for all firms to uh, confirm that their proposal they submitted was still adequate or if they needed to revise it in any way. None of the firms revised their original proposal given those facts. We then proceeded on February 16th as a team to review those proposals and complete a rubric, which included about 12 different areas that are listed on the document. Um, from the rubric, then we took the top three firms of those, um, of those items that were identified and, and scored. And those three firms then came in on February 21st for an interview, we did it virtually, excuse me. So as we did that virtual interview then on that afternoon, we then um, concluded a recommendation for the board to consider. Um, based on that consideration, there are some notes there as to the things that items that we consider during that process and particularly during the interviews. Additionally, you can see listed then the uh, rates that were also offered by those three firms for a five year period. Um, as we take a look at the recommendation, as a result of this process I've described, we are recommending Clifton Larson Allen for, um, and I'll just read the recommendation if I may, that the Board of Education approves the firm of Clifton Larson Allen be contracted to perform the 2020 2021 financial audit. Field work and final reporting will occur during the fall winter of 2021 22 school year. Okay, thank you. I will take a motion for the recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Connor and, and second, please. Second. Seconded by Director Saeed. I uh, will now open it up for discussion and questions. Uh, Director Alt, you have your hand raised. Thank you, Chair Miller. I uh, just have a brief statement. Um, this recommendation is notable in multiple ways. It is notable in that the recommendation is not for the lowest RFP at $204,300 but the next highest at $225,654, over $21,000 more for our taxpayers. Notable in that part of the recommendation relies on assumed additional expenses. 
As an FYI to this new board, the inclusion of implied expense is unusual in our process in my nearly eight years on this board. Outside of change orders for Vision 191 construction, I can't recall a time in which implied additional expenses have been considered or included as a key determining factor in the recommendation to this board. Notable also, in that part of the RFP process indicated that a, quote, perception of a change in auditor is necessary after a certain number of years, end quote. It is our responsibility as a district to be transparent with our community. I would first like to be clear that for me, this is about change, not about quality of services rendered over time. I appreciate the professionalism and timeliness of services provided by Clifton Larson Allen. This RFP process, however, gives this board the opportunity to make what I would consider to be a healthy and timely change, especially as we continue to face fiscal challenges. Understanding that we have nearly 10 years history with Clifton Larson Allen, I can understand how staff might be reluctant to make changes. As a district, however, we are challenging ourselves district-wide to avoid continuing business as usual, no longer doing things as we always have. This is no different. After 10 years in partnership with Clifton Larson Allen, I think we are now entering a reasonable window of opportunity for change, a change in keeping with 191 strategic directions. By introducing a fresh set of eyes we give ourselves the added opportunity to maximize resources for optimal student learning per our strategic plan. It is a difficult, difficult, it is a hard pill to swallow that we have a recommendation before us which suggests maintaining the status quo based on a bid which on paper, which is all we as a board can go on, is higher than the lowest bid. It is a hard pill to swallow in this current economic environment. A hard pill in these times when we face declining enrollment, right-sizing our budget, in addition to a near-term review of expenditures and current practices to achieve greater efficiencies. As a district, we must adjust. And this RFP is but one example of immediate changes this board can make on behalf of our students, and taxpayers. Given all of these points, I will be voting against this recommendation with the guidance as one of seven to come back with a recommendation that honors the lowest RFP, aligns with healthy change, as well as with the district's need to find efficiencies, both now and in the near term. I invite my fellow board members to weigh their votes carefully and to consider what kind of governance, guidance, and possibly even role modeling we wish to provide on behalf of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Director Alt. <clears throat> Are there any other board members uh, that wish to uh, speak or ask questions this time? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm going to then uh, proceed with our vote to ask uh, Ms. Kenny to call the roll. Connor. Sorry, I wasn't prepared. Aye. Hume. Nay. Miller. Aye. Saeed. Aye. Werb? Nay. Alt? Nay. Chester? Aye. So the uh, motion in front of us to approve the selection of auditor passes with a four to three vote. Thank you all for your attention and uh, thoughtful conscience about it this evening. Uh, we will now move to the next item in our new business, and that is the Achievement and Integration Budget Approval. Uh, 
Speaking will be Amina Afdal, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Amina, welcome. Uh, uh, board Chair, Superintendent, members of the board, I am uh, sharing with you the achievement and integration budget um, and asking for your approval of said budget. The budget is uh, submitted each year to the Department of uh, Education. It is uh, the budget, uh, yearly budget to support the three-year plan. The three-year plan uh, runs from 2020 to 2023. Um, and the budget supports the four goals of the Achievement and Integration Plan, um, increasing our four-year graduation rate, increasing the percentage of um, uh, kindergarten readiness, decreasing the disparities uh, for our economically disadvantaged students um, and students of color, and uh, increasing the percentage of students uh, access to teachers in classrooms with culturally responsive pedagogy. So those are the four goals. The budget supports them directly. Um, the strategies um, that we use to achieve these goals, AVID programming, uh, bridging the, which we just had a fab fabulous presentation of, bridging cultural and socioeconomic barriers, family engagement, uh, rigorous coursework and learning opportunities, and building the capacity for equitable and culturally proficient schools. Those are the five strategies that in our plan that have been approved by the Department of Ed. Um, the budget before you supports all of our AVID programming. It supports uh, the uh, cultural and socioeconomic barriers by supporting our social worker staffing and our cultural liaison staffing. Um, it also promotes uh, directly uh, works with our family engagement in promoting, uh, providing uh, parent academy uh, staff. And it also uh, directly relates to our professional development for CPSS, our culturally proficient school system. So those are the items that are supported by our achievement and integration plan. Okay, um, so the, I will just open the link here. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the proposed full year, fiscal year 20. 22 achievement and integration revenue budget. May I have a motion for the recommendation in front of us? So moved. Moved by Director Alt and a second, please. Second. Uh, Director Word, I believe. Yes. Um, all right. Uh, any discussion or questions around the recommendation in front of us? All right, seeing none. Uh, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Hume. Aye. Miller. Aye. Saeed. Aye. Werb. Aye. Alt. Aye. Chester. Aye. Connor. Aye. Very well. The uh, motion that the Board of Education approve the proposed fiscal year 2022 achievement and integration revenue budget passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Miller. Now we will move to the next item and that is to approve changes to the 2021-2022 academic calendar. Uh, welcoming back to the microphone, Brian Gersich, Assistant Superintendent. Uh, thank you, Chair Miller. And thank you again, uh, Board of Directors. Uh, I'm here again talking about calendar, this time a potential change recommended in our school calendar for next fall. Uh, it was about late January, the District 191 and number of school districts throughout the metro area, probably throughout the state, but for sure in the metro, uh, received a request to adjust the start of our school day uh, because right now the first day of school is scheduled to be Rosh Hashanah, which is a significant uh, holiday in the Jewish faith. As we talked about earlier, when we talked about the procedures and parameters, we work hard as a district to be respectful of the many cultures and religions that exist within our community. And we try proactively as a part of our process to uh, identify what we can on the front end. 
Rosh Hashanah is a, a holiday that does tend to move. I'm not, not tend, it does move. It's not on the same predictable date every year. Uh, so certainly that does create uh, some complexities. Certainly as we go through the process, it's not possible within our school calendar to, to have a calendar that takes off all of the, the religious and cultural holidays within our district. So this is about making change where we can. Well, we also, at this time, even before we had this, we've been working to continue to build our internal calendar. And that's where we continue to reach out to our uh, community for, to understand significant cultural and religious holidays. So at least we have a way in our planning. Even if our school calendar can't take off every day from a student day, we can at least make sure that we're planning significant assignments, assessments, and other instructional things around days when we know our families are going to be celebrating and missing from school. So please understand we continue to do that and we acknowledge we can't always make a change and we'll, we'll do the best that we can when we're building the calendar or in a situation like this. Um, I think this is, a, is unique and coming forward to us because it is the first day of school. Uh, and so we did investigate, is this a change that we could make? It did appear that it was, we could honor this with a fairly simple change of moving the school start date back to September 8th and taking a day that was going to be a non-student day for a four day weekend for Memorial Day and turn that Friday into a student day, which it does happen, I think frequently that that day is already a student contact day. Uh, I will add in, in networking with uh, a lot of the South Metro districts, I would say my understanding, although I haven't verified by looking at their board minutes, but through my conversations with colleagues, all of the districts that border us have made this change to their school calendar and moved it to September 8th. As the, the so with that, uh, I will read the recommendation and, and what you'll see again is the two calendars there. Just the only adjustment you'll see is the change from September 7th uh, becoming a non-student day. So, um, uh, May 17th becoming a student contact day. The recommendation is that the Board of Education approves the revised 2021-22 school calendar, moving the school start date from Tuesday, September 7th to Wednesday, September 8th, and changing May 27th, 2022 to a school day. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Uh, the, I would be seeking a motion for the recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Chester and a second. Second. Seconded by Director Hume. I'll open it up for any questions or clarifications at this time. Uh, Director Connor, you have your hand raised? Yes, I just, I just wondered if you, uh, is that the only day that you could see that would easily be moved to a non-student day was the Labor Day weekend? Uh, or Memorial, for Mem Memorial Day weekend, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was gonna be the least intrusive because other things would actually also be moving potential staff development days um, or other days. So it really was the most logical change because it was a student day for a non-student day. Okay, thank you. And if I could just add to that one other piece that we, it was a modified process, but we still had the same opportunities for all of our bargaining units uh, to, to weigh in on that. It's a small change, but we did create some feedback loop to check that change as well. Any other questions? All right, seeing none, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Miller? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Werb? Aye. Alt? Aye. Chester? Aye. Connor? Aye. Hume? Aye. And uh, the motion on the recommendation in front of us passes unanimously. I uh, will now move to uh, approve on a first reading basis changes to policy 611, homeschooling. Speaking on uh, this uh, reading is Amina Afdal, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Thank you, Board Chair. Um, I am presenting to you the uh, revisions for the homeschooling policy 611, 
The revisions come from a legislative change, which is updating the definition of teacher materials that are included in um, uh, uh, materials available to share with homeschool families. All right, thank you. So the recommendation directly here. So I uh, will seek a motion on the recommendation that the Board of Education approves on a first read basis changes to policy 611 homeschooling. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by Director Hume and a second. Director Alt, I believe you were trying to second. All right, very good. Uh, any questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, uh, Ms. Hume, or uh, sorry, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Saeed. Aye. Werb. Aye. Alt. Aye. Chester. Aye. Connor. Aye. Hume. Aye. Miller. Aye. And uh, the motion in front of us passes unanimously. Thank you, Chair Miller. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, please. Ask the question. Very good. Um, next, we will move to uh, approve cooperative sponsorship in girls lacrosse with Apple Valley. Coming to the microphone with a recommendation, Guillaume Pieck, our director of athletics. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Miller, uh, board of directors. Thank you for taking the time to hear this recommendation. Um, I'm putting forth a recommendation to approve a cooperative sponsorship in girls lacrosse uh, with Apple Valley. Um, currently, our numbers will not afford our students an opportunity to uh, participate in girls lacrosse. Um, and we found a, a, a very good match uh, with Apple Valley High School. Their numbers are a little bit well, they're higher than ours, but it, it would be a perfect marriage um, in that there's not an excessive number where there would be cuts. Um, we would be able to retain both you know, both schools together without having to eliminate opportunities just from a size standpoint. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> All right, very well. The uh, recommendation in front of us, uh, we're looking for a motion on the recommendation that the Board of Education approves the cooperative sponsorship in girls across between Burnsville High School and Apple Valley High School. May I have a motion? Moved by Director Connor and a second. Second. Uh, sorry, that was Director Saeed. Very well. Uh, are there any questions or comments? I just had a couple of quick things um, for uh, uh, Mr. Repek. Uh, so does this, um, are we looking at the opportunity to, to share practice facilities and such in this endeavor? So that our students all don't have to go to Apple Valley the whole time or how's that going to work? So actually the way that we have it structured right now, all of the practices um, and competitions will occur at Burnsville High School um, since we will be the host site. Um, we've worked together with Apple Valley to, to coordinate um <clears throat> some of the logistical pieces um and so with that I mean, we will be playing one home game uh, this year at apple valley apple valley is actually getting their their stadium um done this year with turf um but prior to that they're going to they're we're going to have a senior night for the apple valley girls at apple valley before their field gets torn up and then you know we'll have ours here but no to answer your question all the practices and competitions will be here minus the one um senior night at apple valley okay uh director all looks like you have your hand raised yeah i just wanted to thank you i appreciate the creativity that you put into this you know trying to maintain that um that access to opportunity for our athletes and um, you know, great to know that um, the combination of the two won't um, cause any cuts um, for any of the players. So thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, then um, seeing no further questions or comments, uh, Ms. Kenny, will you please call the roll? Orb? Aye. Alt? Aye. Chester? Aye. Connor? Aye. Hume? Aye. Miller? Aye. Saeed? Aye. Uh, with that, the motion in front of us passes unanimously. Uh, next, we will move to uh, awarding the contract replacement of network switches. Uh, coming to the microphone now will be Rachel Gordon, Director of Technology. Ms. Gordon. Thank you very much. Good evening, Chair Miller, Board of Directors, and Superintendent Battle. Um, tonight, I'm bringing a recommendation for um, a contract approval for replacement for network switches and two lab switch replacements um, that will be at Nicollet. There will be 172 building access switches that will be replaced in the majority of our buildings. Um, and then those two that are specifically lab uh, switches that will be at Nicollet. This project was earmarked as part of a long-term network infrastructure upgrade. Um, and the original switches that are, or the switches that are there now have an anticipated life of five to seven years and they were put in in 2014. Um, the, the switch project qualifies for E-rate funding, which is a federal funding source that comes uh, from the FCC and is a category two funding, which allows us to be uh, reimbursed a uh, significant. So it's for public, it's for schools and libraries across the United States. Um, I did put in some information in there because um, our qualification rate, our reimbursement rate has been at 80%. Um, in 2019. And looking at, it, this is based on our application for educational benefits. So I know we've talked about this in, in um, earlier um, uh, board meetings, but uh, this year was unique. Um, and because of the number of applicants, we actually qualified only at 60%. There is conversation and we do anticipate um, that the FCC is going to allow the 2019 rates um, to take effect. And so that's why you, why you will see on the recommendation that I have both of the 80% and the 60% costs um, that are uh, listed on the um, recommendation. I am asking for the approval at the higher rate in case we do not um, get a ruling from the FCC that allows us that 80%. Um, but I am hopeful and anticipating um, that we're gonna see that 80% rate. With that, I, I, the recommendation um, is to approve this contract. We're choosing High Point Networks uh, as our vendor. Excellent. Uh, I will look for a motion, please, on the recommendation in front of us. So moved. Moved by Director Alt and a second, please. Second. Seconded by Director Connor. At this time, I'll ask if there's any questions or comments on the motion. Uh, Director Alt, you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Not to sound like a broken record, but um, this is another example of how important those free and reduced lunch applications are. And our leaders need to, between now and the start of the new school year, um, we need to do everything as a district that we can to make sure that our families understand the importance of applying and whether you believe you qualify or not for benefits, um, we as a district need all of our families to complete those applications. Uh, thank you, Director Earl. Um, any other questions or comments from board members? I'll just, one thing I just want to be very, very clear. You, you were, you alluded to it, but um, um, Director Gordon, uh, this is, uh, this is long-term capital technology plan. In law, it was in the, it's planning and process. It's been there for a while. It has no relation to the, the last week of, uh, of incidents that are occurring in our network, just to be very clear for any public listening, correct? That is correct. Yeah, they are completely separate situations. Very good. 
All right, at this time I will take a uh, roll call. Uh, Ms. Kenny, please call the roll. Alt. Aye. Chester. Aye. Connor. Aye. Hume. Aye. Miller. Aye. Saeed. Aye. Werb. Aye. Very well, the uh, motion in front of us passes unanimously. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our, the business component of our meeting this evening. We will now, um, I will call the, the regular scheduled meeting to an adjournment and we will adjourn to a workshop about initial um, fiscal year 2022 budget adjustments. Uh, leading this conversation will be Dr. Battle, superintendent and Lisa Ryder, our executive director of business services. This will be uh, the first of two scheduled workshops to discuss uh, these adjustments and the, the opportunity to um, go through them as a, as a group conversation. And go ahead, uh, Dr. Battle, are you gonna lead us out? Or are we gonna turn it directly to uh, Ms. Ryder? Sorry, I thought we were gonna have a break. Oh, we could take a break. <laughs> I, I was, uh, we certainly can do that. Um, All right, thank you. Yeah, let's let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's take it. So I have it as eight thirty-five. Let's adjourn. Uh, regather here at eight forty-five. Uh, Ten minutes from now. Thank you.
Okay. We're back. Now, Dr. Battle, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Chair Miller and directors of the board. So tonight, Lisa and I will present a fiscal year 22 initial budget adjustments based on the strategies we've identified to develop next year's budget. Um, these include reductions tied to uh, decline in enrollment, use of fund balance, utilizing carryover, use of ESSER funds, and um, a, a deep dive review of our expenditures and budget processes to address our, our budget going forward. So I wanted to also say that uh, I know it's one of the most difficult decisions to build a budget that has a reduction of staff because we do know our 190 staff are value colleagues and necessary supports um, for our children and their families. And they are also contributing community members. Um, I know each of our colleagues has done exemplary, creative, and selfless work to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is a time, one for the ages, um, and I do believe we have been strong and successful in our efforts to educate our children and teenagers, to provide critical services to our families and community, and approaching our day-to-day -day work with our district values of high expectations, respect, integrity, and partnership in mind. I do know that anytime we look at uh, reductions, um, it may mean uh, colleagues will lose their livelihood and I do not take this lightly. Um, and so really to continue to be good stewards of the taxpayer's money um, and maximizing our resources that we are given. Um, as I mentioned, we lead with our values. We also, this board has given us strategic priorities and the support for the pre-K-12 pathways program and our equity work. And so it's really important that we ensure to our community that we are committed to those priorities, even at a time when we have to make some um, decisions, difficult decisions. Um, since we last met, previously we shared with you Governor Walls presented his funding proposal. So since we last met, this is new information, the House did uh, release their omnibus bill and it includes new mandates. And so um, we might consider uh, these areas are fixed costs that we have to do what the legislature, what they finally decide upon. Um, and I know this board has talked about um, unfunded mandates before. And so this is another unknown. And so uh, just really reading that bill that, and trying to see all the new mandates and see if they have a uh, funding tied to it. Um, and so that's another unknown that uh, as we go through this process, we'll continue to update you. Um, so um, we're gonna go to the formal presentation right now. The first few slides should be very familiar to you. Um, but we always want to include them in case we have new viewers to these uh, budget discussions. And so Aaron, you can put up the presentation. So our agenda tonight, a uh, review of some very familiar items. First with our uh, guiding change document, we'll go through our assumptions and current reality that Lisa presented before our strategies, as I've mentioned, for building a budget. And based on those strategies, we're gonna pre present some uh, budget adjustments. And then we'll end with next steps and in the short term and long term, and then open it up to questions. And so um, I'm not gonna go over the next slide. Um, as you know, the guiding change document um, is based on us taking a priorities and values-based approach rather than an across the board cut. Um, um, it outlines in very detail the current situation and outcomes we want to achieve and the things that are not acceptable for us to do. Next slide. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Lisa to run through those assumptions again. And so right now you'll see uh, we're still at zero um, and still many other districts are still very cautious. And so as we get new information, so I'll turn it over to Lisa for the next few slides. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Dr. Battle. Um, as we know, our revenues are largely dependent upon the enrollment. So we are 
uh, stating, restating here our enrollment projections for the next school year that are used in the projections that you see before you as we get into this presentation. Um, as Dr. Battle said, the 0% on the formula is our current status. Our federal funds that are related to pandemic relief. Um, we made our first bra, uh, excuse me, our first draw today from the CARES One funds for the expenditures that we incurred from July through December of this year. And so um, we are we are utilizing those funds as we speak, and we'll plan to use any additional CARES funds too as well in our process. And we are anticipating for next school year that we will have the compensatory funding at a reduced amount based upon the fact that we had a lower enrollment coupled with the lesser number of applications that were completed by families who may be eligible for free or reduced meals. Next slide, please. As we talk about our assumptions under spending, um, we have built in some assumptions for our, in order to prepare numbers for you to, to know kind of what we were anticipating for spending next year. Those assumptions are um, built in with regard to salary and benefit assumptions. As you know, the vast majority of our budget is, in, um, in, is spent on people. And then you see a few other items listed there with regard to assumptions being made, some of which are due to contracts. Some are just anticipated increases. Others, it's more about we're not increasing the dollar amount or decreasing the dollar amount because there is a set number for um, projects that have been identified or we know we're gonna stay within that budget even though we may have to make things stretch further, if that makes sense. Next slide, please. So with your revenue assumptions and your spending assumptions, you come to a current reality. When we spoke in January, our current reality was really based upon the information we had at that time, which was our revised budget for the current year. So that's what this slide reflects is the last column being our revised budget for the current year as of January, 2021. This is normally our starting point as we begin to build for next year's budget. This year, you'll find that we're gonna talk a little bit more about this uh, starting point. So as you go to the next slide, in February, we discussed what that might mean. So for instance, the previous slide showed an ending projected fund balance for the current year of 19.79 million. And here you see that it's starting for the next year in this slide in February at 21.29. And what would be the difference, that $1.5 million? That difference, as you may recall, is the amount of adjustments that we anticipate we could make to our spending right now this year and actually be assured that that would fall into the fund balance at the end of this year, go unspent this year, and be available for next year's expenditures instead. So if that's the, the um, assumption being made, then we would be beginning our planning for next year at a, a higher number of fund balance at the start end. The projected revenues you see listed here, they reflect the dollar amounts that are um, calculated given the estimated enrollment we talked about, the 0% on the formula. The projected expenditures you see are based upon a line item detail of our object dimensions and our expenditures brought forward with certain percentage increases for some line items and others at 0%. While doing that, you have a projected revenue of 122.45 million and projected expenditures of 133.31 million. That difference is a $10.86 million. The, really the point of the slide is what you, what might, some people might look at this and say, this is, this is the problem that we need to address. That $10.86 million is the problem we need to address. Um, if, if that were to be spent down at that level with no adjustments whatsoever, no, no strategies utilized, you'd find that your ending fund balance would be at 10.43 million. And I'm not talking about just the unassigned, I'm talking about everything we have for reserves, total dollars, all reserves, all inclusive. And that's not something that we can really allow to go forward as it would um, decimate our fund balance. So let's go to the next slide and talk about the strategies for building the budget. With that having been our starting point, let's get into what we're, the strategies we're talking about for building our budget. They revolve around the goal 
of protecting our programming, staffing, and services so we can provide stability for our students. Our strategy is for doing that while also maintaining um, the while also maintaining the six percent unassigned fund balance goal of the board. We're going to prioritize those investments we're making in our pre-K twelve pathways model, including programming and services. We'd also be maximizing our use of our federal funds for the pandemic relief, our restricted fund balances, and also our unassigned fund balance, basically the greatest possible use of the funds we have available to us. So uh, the next slide talks about the strategies for building a budget. And I'll pause to see if Dr. Battle would like to speak to this. So earlier in the regular board meeting, you uh, received the achievement and integration budget. So MDE um, requests that districts send it in uh, by our March date so they can review all of them. Um, as we go forward in the budget season, um, and as you see, one of the items here is to pursue equity, cultural proficiency, including cultural liaisons um, as a priority. They do allow us in April to make a revision um, but it is part of our full uh, board. Uh, the budget will bring you in June. And so um, we've already given you details about that part of the budget we will present finally in June. Next slide. So with the um, strategy or the priorities being identified, then we turn next to the maximizing our federal pandemic relief funds. So as I discussed, we, we are currently utilizing our CARES One funds in FY21. Any carryover we may have from those funds, we would then carry forward into FY22 to use there as well. Um, we would plan to use the CARES Two funds in FY22. And should there be any carryover still remaining, then that would be used more towards the FY23 fiscal year. Next slide, please. So Lisa, can I make a oh, note sorry. on the, the care? So as you may know, President Biden uh, did sign the, let me get the correct name, American Rescue Act. So today MDE let us know as soon as they get uh, more information, uh, Minnesota, did we, it's projected Minnesota will receive um, an allocation and then they'll run all the numbers uh, for each district in the state and then they'll give us the guidance. Um, they did say that uh, pretty much the uh, uses are similar to the previous CARES funding, but there is a particular emphasis on addressing learning loss. And so I just wanted to share that's another new information today we just learned about today from MDE. Thank you, Lisa. Yes, thank you, Dr. Battle. So the next category of strategies is for us to really take a look at our use of our restricted, committed, and assigned fund balances. This would require some procedural actions um, aside from waiving the current 8% unassigned fund balance policy that the board does carry in policy number 714. The board would also be looking at committing and assigning fund balances that are also included in that policy 714. That action is actually taken in June at the same time that you would be adopting the budget, or I should say right before that. Um, taking these steps does allow us then to protect the unassigned fund balance without sacrificing our instructional and service priorities for students. Next slide, please. So as we take a look at what this looks like for FY22, we talked about that $10.86 million to begin with as being the, the challenge for us, right? Now, as we take a look at right sizing for enrollment, we're gonna see that that's about a million dollars. And I've got another couple of slides that we'll take a look at with more detail around this. The next um, step then would be to use those fund balances that restricted, I'm sorry, committed and um, assigned fund balances of up to $5.96 million in our projection, just to offset that over um, expenditures that exceed revenues. In addition, as part of the revenues and the expenditures, we would anticipate the full approximate $5.4 million in revenues, but we would use 3.9 million of those dollars for current and existing expenditures that are rolling forward. 
And then the remaining $1.5 million would be for additional added type expenditures that we could anticipate for next year. And this is referring mostly just to the CARES 2 funds that we've already been, um, we've seen an indication of, but we haven't seen the actual allocation yet. So the assumption is a $5.4 million amount. If we were not to use the fund balances as a strategy to offset the expenditures that exceed revenues, without that strategy in play, then we would be needing to look at um, an additional $4.27 million in program staff and service reductions. Next slide, please. So this is the first part of the initial budget listing that there's a one pager. And so this is part one and two of it. So as we talked about the million dollars for right sizing of enrollment, you can see here that that's really kind of talking about we know the additional staff that we hired for COVID reasons and support this year, that they would be released, okay? And those are federal funds that we would, we would not continue carrying those expenditures forward into next year, but rather release those. Then the staff, school staffing, excuse me, um, that would be reduced across the board with regard to the number of students that we have. And that varies at each level, depending upon the, the number of students that are present or not present in each of the different grade levels and classes. And so that's where you see a range listed here. And that range is somewhere between that 950,000 to 1.25 million. And so that's why we've been using the term of $1 million as an, an average amount for that whole section of right sizing enrollment. Then a second strategy you see then identified is a, a reiteration of what I said about the the maximizing the funding source. And this is the pandemic funds that we have that we're estimating at $5.4 million of revenue. And you can see that 3.9 million would be used for current expenditures moving forward. While 750,000 approximately would be for the seven to 10 FTEs of additional staffing that we would anticipate we may need next year. Similar to what you see on the uh, first line of numbers, in section one there for additional staff we had hired this year as needed. Yeah, let's see, the third line down here then under number two is for additional expenditures. This may not be related to staffing so much as it might be related to um, personal professional, or sorry, personal protective equipment and uh, materials that might be needed across the board as we um, get into next school year. Next slide, please. This last part of the page, um, numbers three and four, number three is really talking about the savings that we may realize in the current school year. So as we look at our revised budget and going through what have we spent, what have we not spent, and identifying where we're spending this, the CARES funds, we are trying to, um, pinpoint for you line items broken down by the various type of expenditures that you can anticipate we would be looking at identifying these savings coming out of this year. So for instance, let me just choose a line here. Um, the consultant services, you see there's $600,000 listed there. That comes from a number of different budget areas, but you can see where they are all accumulated to that total amount. Um, you see an amount listed there for contingency, the contingency for elementary and special ed. Typically when we have um, an unknown situation with, with the budget as we did going into this year, not knowing what learning model we were going to be in, when we might have to change from one learning model to another, the two areas that we typically felt that we would need that support would be in the elementary area and in the special education area. So a contingency was established for those two areas totaling the $280,000 that would be used should they need additional staffing. To be honest, the, the federal funds have addressed those needs as necessary. Um, and in the area of special education, it's really been more about a matter of, of uh, where those needs have been required. And the fact is that many of the staff have been able to manage the needs of our students without needing to hire these additional positions in, that you see listed under the contingency. Um, we could keep going down through the list if you like. Um, I don't know how much explanation you want, but that's I'm trying to point out just a few of these to give you an example of what 
what these may be, but these are all within the current year's revised budget. Concept being, they aren't spent. We anticipate that now. We bring before you an amendment to your revised budget for the current year, which allows us then to start with a beginning projected fund balance that is higher than what we're current, currently showing on the um, projected ending fund balance for this year. That's part of the strategies. The last line item you see listed there for number four are some miscellaneous reductions that are, are identified here if needed, and that is for district level staffing for district wide support and services. And uh, that's a range here as well, because much of this is unknown at this very moment, as people still have opportunities to make decisions with regard to where they will be next year. And with that, through attrition, through retirements, through other means, there may be adjustments that are necessary there. And there's a lot that, of work that is yet to be done during the months of April and May as we develop that line item budget and um, people are identified for exact positions for the next year. Lisa, before you move on to the next slide, uh, I wanted to make a note about, we are projecting uh, less 300 students. Um, information that we have gathered since we last met. We looked at our special education numbers. And so um, if you look at December 2019 enrollment and December 2020 enrollment, we're almost 150 students less. However, special education is funded on end of year. So we're using that as a good projection. So that's one of the other things that we really don't know because you have to look at each student's IEP to determine the appropriate support. And then another note about our English language learners, you look at the numbers, but you also have to look at the very different levels of language proficiency to determine the services. And so we'll be working on that, um, on those numbers through uh, the end of this month in April. So wanted to add that piece also those pieces also. Thank you, Dr. Battle. At this point, I would um, like to share my screen if that's okay. And I wanna move us to the interactive model, which is the next slide. And seeing all of these things pulled together into this particular screen, you should now see um, the general fund budget comparative summary with um, some colors on there, right? Okay. So uh, with this, um, pointing out a couple of things, um, here's the revised budget column for the current year. And as you take a look at the AC column here, this one right here, um, this is where this number is higher than what we were projecting to you in January when we revised the budget. So that's because we identified $1.69 million of adjustments to the current revised budget that we believe could be made and that we would not be spending those dollars this year. So if, if those adjustments are made, then that means your expenditures decline. It means your fund balance then projected forward increases and begins then the next 2022 school year at a higher uh, beginning fund balance. Here is reflected the federal funds in the pink of the $5.4 million revenue and the anticipated added, added, excuse me, added expenditures using federal funds of $1.5 million. The difference between those two, the 3.9 is then going to be utilized to basically cover $3.9 million of your otherwise calculated expenditures that roll forward. You show then an uh, expenditure total greater than the revenue total of $5.968 million and an ending total fund balance of $15.5 million. Um, these are estimates down here when you get into the restricted, committed, and um, assigned and unassigned. But the key point is, as you look at the previous year, as the audit is completed, the board would take action in Jan June, excuse me, to one, waive waive the 8% fund balance policy that you have. It would two, take action to assign and commit. And the board has not assigned previously, but assignment in your policy allows you 
to assign up to the amount that is projected to be in deficit in the coming years. You can assign up to that amount in your fund balance. And then you also have the ability to commit funds as you choose. The board must take action in June prior to adopting the next year's budget, even though the calculation of those dollar amounts will occur during the audit process. So you're basically just giving me authority for the fact that calculate these committed funds, calculate this assigned amount and set that aside then as committed and assigned when you calculate those fund balances. Those dollars then are available for use in offsetting the dollars that are expended over the revenues in the coming FY22 school year, allowing a protection of the unassigned dollars to allow at least a 6% unassigned fund balance. The assumptions used in this process, as we've mentioned, have been a 0% in this first year on the gen ed formula. And um, our expenditures, we are assuming that we're not going to have the carryovers of the federal funds. I will tell you when we revise next year's budget, there will be carryover funds that will be available for use and they are planning to utilize those. So for instance, if Title I funds aren't used fully this year, there's some carryover coming into the next year that will be available. But at this point in time, as we build the adopted budget, we do not include those carryovers. In that case, we are eliminating those from the expenditures so that they're not counted twice. And the $1 million we discussed earlier is identified here in this dollar amount. The other adjustments that's identified as the 50,000 to 250,000, that could be a number you put in here then. So if, if for instance, I put in 50,000, that then changes slightly the expenditures that we have up here and therefore also the fund balance. So I hope that that kind of explains the, that uh, model we're using and how all of those components and strategies come into play in one. I'm going to stop sharing. And if um, Aaron, if you'd bring back up the PowerPoint presentation, there's a few more slides here. So can we go to the next slide? And I think one more. There you go. So as we review the budget timeline, tonight is um, a review of this model. March 25th is an opportunity for us to also provide additional budget updates for FY22. And April, during that month is when typically there are the, the work is done with regard to who's going to be where and doing what position. And it's at that point in time, you'll see actions come before you related to human resource items. Um, presented for staffing resolutions that might be necessary. During the month of May is the time in which we prepare the line item budget, pulling all the information from HR and adding into it all of the other line items that are non-personnel and prepare for you then by the first meeting in June, um, the superintendent presents a recommended budget to you in June with um, the second meeting being the opportunity then to adopt that FY22 budget. It is by June 30th of every school year that the board must approve and adopt budget for the following year. Uh, the next slide, please. We continue to receive budget input um, online at the, at the website that you see listed here with the two questions you see listed here being asked. And then I think the next slide, Dr. Battle, would you like to speak to this one? Uh, just briefly to uh, engage in that deep dive process, because as you know, ESSER funds won't be here forever, and we still have that declining enrollment. We're hoping to stabilize with our great programming. Um, as you know, this year we started off uh, with uh, lower kindergarten numbers, but as uh, we implemented um, with safety protocols, our learning models, more of those kindergartners came back. So that's a good sign. Um, and we do believe that uh, we uh, will get some enrollment back uh, that was lost due to the pandemic. Um, with that, we'll open it up for questions. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> um, 
There we go. All right. I will just, uh, this is a workshop. So why don't we go ahead and just open up the microphone if you'd like to um, ask for clarification and questions, go right ahead, please. I'm wondering if Lisa could pull up the one spreadsheet that she had shown, because I do have questions on that. <clears throat> While we're doing that, I um, want to express that, for, especially for the newer members, this is quite a lot to absorb. Um, uh, you know, try to uh, get what you can think of tonight answered. Um, Take some time to think about it after tonight. Um, take some, if you need to, in between, um, you know, get some questions off to Dr. Battle and um, Lisa Ryder. And then we will have a, another workshop to openly discuss this as things, as we think of things, things change. So, all right, go ahead. Uh, yes. Oh, um, just to understand under the, um, the revised budget that we have presented. So, I noticed between the adopted budget and the revised budget on restricted there, we went from 3 million to seven. Is that reflective of the CARES funding? Okay, no, it's not. So when you look at those line items that are down below, they are created at the time in which that budget is addressed. So for instance, when we did the adopted budget, we did not have the audit complete yet, okay? So we were anticipating that we were going to see a spend down in the restricted funds last year and that that would spend down even further in the in the FY21 budget to 3 million. But when the audit was complete, these restricted funds primarily are made up of operating capital, ALC. And this last year I think that was it, but I can't remember for sure. I had to check on that for you. So, so it increased on us instead of it declining, right? So as a result, then you see that this number now is what the most comparison is, right? So here you're seeing that I'm showing a $500,000 spend, uh, 550, oops, $530,000 spend down almost here between the restricted funds, okay? Um, as you look across, then we're still kind of going with those same assumptions and you can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to spend down this restricted fund balance before we spend down the unassigned. So first and foremost, we're gonna spend down those restricted funds where possible. Then we're gonna look to um, the spend down of the committed and assigned as we move into next year. And then on the assigned, because there's, the only year it's reflecting a 4.7 million compared to all the other years is in the revised budget. Is that the CARES money I'm trying to uh, see nope. where, okay. So what that is, it's, it's brand new. It, you have the ability within your fund balance policy and that assignment, typically in many other entities, that assignment might be something that I might assign those dollars as business manager, but that's not the case for us. The board holds the authority in our district for both commitment and assignment of fund balance. Therefore, the board has never assigned fund balance in the past, but you have it written into the policy explaining what that can be. And you can assign fund balance up to the amount of a projected deficit in the future for the purpose of covering that deficit. And this would be basically exercising that fund balance policy that you already have in play. Okay, and then, um, and I know that we as a board committed to, we didn't want to dip below 6% for our unassigned fund balance, but me wanting to look always in the future going, it might save us now uh, and next year, only getting to that 6%, but we're going to be in an operating huge loss going into the next fiscal year. And so I don't know if, if we need to look at um, additional or consider additional <coughs> reductions going into the next fiscal year, because I think we will be extremely challenged in, in the following fiscal year. Right, so that's where that long range slide comes into play. And the fact that, that that process would actually begin very soon for us in identifying, um, well, it's more than identifying. It's really more about a deep dive into exactly what we have for expenditures now 
and how exactly are those expenditures being made across our program areas? And then how is it that we can best maximize the use of that moving forward? And where should we possibly change our model if that's necessary when we're taking a look at how we're spending our funds moving forward? So that's more in the long range piece where that second year out gets addressed. Yeah, it, I, my only, my, my biggest concern is that we won't have CARES funding to necessarily help us in fiscal year 23 to help save us. And we're going to be facing over $15 million in cuts. Oh, I hear you. So I mentioned earlier that uh, we did get a little bit of information about the American uh, Rescue Act. And we were told by MDE it's available July 1st and it's going through September 30th, 2023. But we'll wait till we get it in writing since it was just signed today. I think Anna's hand is up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I just thought I'd go ahead and speak freely. Oh, okay. No, um, no worries. That's okay. Um, so I know we've had quite a number of conversations already, and this may have been covered, but it's a lot to absorb. Um, so when I'm looking at expenditures over the past several years, and looking at 2021, 2020 and 2021 to 21, 22, why the, the sudden jump in expenditures, they seem a lot higher than from past years, from like 1920 to 2021 and 2021 to 20, well, I guess, whatever, even from the, even from the actual to the revised. I, I just, why is it like, it seems like it's 4 million. I, I mean, is this, is that a normal jump in expenditures or is, I mean, is there a, a typical percentage increase okay. for expenditures, but it seems like it's more from, so last year to this year? A couple of things. As you may recall, um, as we revised the budget this year, we needed to address the fact that we had two funds that came into this year's um, general fund. So we used to track our student activity funds outside of board control. That meant they weren't included in the general fund at all. Because of, because of COVID, they normally run $600,000 of revenue, $600,000 of expenditures. But because of COVID, I only brought in 200,000 of revenue and 200,000 of expenditures because they're just not functioning like they would normally, right? So in the budget that you see for revised 21, this 128 million includes both the 200,000 that is identified from the student activity funds and the second piece is the trust fund for, well, it used to be called a trust fund, but because of GASB 84, we can no longer keep that separate and it has to be in, enveloped in general fund. And it's for our flex plan. Our flex plan is when employees will identify a dollar amount that they want to take out of their check on a regular basis and that money is set aside. And then if it's dependent care or if it's medical type related mm -hmm. stuff, they can draw on it, right? Yep. If they um, don't use their funds that they identify, they lose those funds. But those dollars have to be kept track of revenue and expenditures. And now that has to be included in our general fund. 
it used to be outside of the general fund and tracked in a separate fund eight. But as of the revised budget, that was brought into the totals for revenue and expenditures. Okay. So you're seeing the increase both on the revenue end and on the expenditure end for the, about a million dollars just because of those two things, okay? So when you compare that, that if you took a million dollars off from that, then we're pretty close on expenditures, right? Oh. So, and why the revenues? There's a, there's a few reasons on the revenues. You know, you've got this million dollars here, but you also have um, revenues that are being placed in here that are now a little bit more accurate than we were at adopted. So whether it's because of uh, federal funds that were now reflected in the revised and they're reflected in the expenditures, those are in here too then. Okay, so you'll see that happen between adopted to revised where all the carryover dollars come in at the revised time and they're not there for the adopted. Okay. Um, we did separate out the federal funds that are related to COVID only in this line here, row seven and in row nine. So at this point in time, we know we have spent the 2.7 million that was the coronavirus relief funds and they had to be spent by December 31st. And then as of today, we drew down another 540,000 of our ESSER one funds for other expenditures that were incurred between July and December as well. So of the 4.2 million, we have spent 3.2, 3.2. We have a plan as well for the remainder of the year as of spending the rest of it as well. So those lines, those are completely separate. So those don't get included in the revenue. They, they yeah, get included here on this line because I am taking both uh -huh. the revenue lines and I am subtracting both the expenditure lines to get this number. Oh, okay. 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 So they are, they are being, but they are pulled out just so that you can see them oh, better gotcha. and understand. Okay. Because if they're all together, then this number looks really high. Right. Okay. So I had a couple of questions. Um, and forgive me because it's been a long day. Um, but um, this question, Dr. Battle, is for you. Maybe I missed it, but in the presentation, I didn't see a presentation of the final budget adjustments to the board. Um, I just see workshops discussing it and then we move to April um, where the HR actions are proposed. On what date do we actually receive that final detailed list of, of adjustments before we go to the HR process? Mm -hmm. So um, in the board planning document, a call for two workshops in March. And so uh, working with the officers, uh, I think uh, uh, Chair Miller said the next uh, meeting, March 25th, will be a workshop. And so Stacy Sovine, can you, uh, are you looking at staffing at the second meeting in April? And then it would actually be the first meeting in April, I'm not sure for the staffing. And then the office and I, we, I don't, I don't want to speak for Leslie and Eric. Well, there must've been some so you, of when. So your question happened. is when are we bringing the final budget adjustments? So each year when we do, when we go through this budget process, we have a final document that details the adjustments before the HR um, process begins. When do we get that document? Plan is to have that for the, ready for the next workshop in two weeks from now, on the 25th. So we'd be receiving it in workshop rather than in a regular board meeting. Uh, Dr. Battle, I think we discussed this in the last officers meeting. We talked about presenting it. We will, we will have an informational component where we will present it in the board meeting and then we will retire to the workshop to, dis to, to discuss it again. 
that, e that same evening. So then the final document would actually come to us the first meeting in April before any action is requested of us. If, I just want to understand the timeline, that's all. Mm -hmm. If I may, Dr. Battle, yeah. um, the, the dollar amount, I'm trying to pull up another slide here, sorry, let me just find my mouse, there we go. Um, I'm gonna show the slide screen again, but this time with a different document, which is the, so you should see now the, the initial budget adjustments list. And I just wanna make sure that we're talking the same because I, I need a little clarity because as you talk about final list of adjustments, this, th these, these strategies that you see listed here, one, two, three, four, encompass everything we have brought forward to you and that we would plan to bring forward to you. So there's there's not an additional list. But this is not the this is not the succinct and discrete list of items that um, that we are eventually taking action on. I, I guess Lisa, you remember in years past, we've always had a very detailed list. We have those, those are list of reductions, which we don't have included here. I'm sorry. The list of reductions that you are, have seen in the past have been what we used in order to solve the upcoming budget, re, um, budget challenges. This year, we're asking for the use of these strategies instead to meet the requirement the board identified of the 6% fund balance unassigned. With those strategies in play, as we, as we have described, including the savings from the current year that we would roll forward, that would mean that you would not look to expect to see any list in that re miscellaneous reductions, except for an amount between 50 to 250,000 related to that which we can do at a district level and doesn't necessarily impact the teaching and other staffing that you see at the buildings. And I guess this is a departure from um, past and standard practice. It, it makes me feel uncomfortable to simply have a range when every single year that I've been on the board, we've always known exactly what it is that is going to take place in April. So uh, we are uh, from last year, around the same week we presented the initial and then it was the end of March was the final. So what's mm -hmm. different this year? We are behind in our budget planning with our directors and principals. So we missed one budget meeting because that was the day Governor Walsh announced that he was going to, we could go to in-person for elementary. So then the attention turned to what is the new guidance, understanding it. So even though we're behind one budget meeting with our leaders, we still are pretty much on track for what the board got last year. There was a slide with FTE, um, an approximate number and about what the cost would be. Not the rain, though. If you look back at the document, it was it was right. very specific. So you're saying right you're because saying we haven't had the time to work with the principals, and so Stacy Sovine can give more information about the staffing process and what needs to be done. I guess so. What you're saying then, Dr. Battle, is that we will have a discrete list, understanding that you're behind. I'm not. I'm not. Oh, challenged. Yeah. I, not I just mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand the timeline in which we will get that same document that we received last year because I'm not I'm not hearing it and I didn't see it in the in the presentation maybe I missed it this is a range is not is not what we what we um, receive as a final discussion on budget So am I, am I understanding that this line item right here that you see as number four miscellaneous reductions, you want that to be just one number? And I thought a, it was the one up above under one, Lisa, the staffing. Will you uh, let Stacy uh, yeah. chime in? It's the one up above, Lisa. It, hey, it's Stacey. this one? 
where there is a range, yep, in, yep. in, in number one, and then again in that last item, you know, if what you're saying, Dr. Battle, is that everything else but those two um, items are fixed, and then when you come back at the end of March at our next meeting, you'll have the range that currently exists in school staffing. You'll have that hammered out to a, to a finite number. Right, and that's what I want Stacy to share. Mm -hmm. we, we won't, we won't have a finite number. I, I mean, the only time that you have a finite number that is actual is one day a year is when you run that report because I have retirements, I have resignations, I have leaves, I have buildings that have discretion based upon their allocation to determine whether they want EAs or a teacher or how they're gonna spend their title money. That's part of the reason why we have a range here. We're not cutting any programs that impacts staffing. All we're doing is right sizing. If we're going to lose 300 students, all of the buildings have been, giving an alloc been given an allocation based upon their projected enrollment for their building. With that, what they're doing now is going through and saying, okay, I have four fewer FTEs allocated to my building. How am I going to make that happen? What areas? So I met with secondary principals today. So, you know, they're they're hammering through, okay, with this many students, I'm not gonna need this many sections of language arts. I'm not gonna need this many sections of FIET. I'm going to have to cut a point two in FIET or maybe a point five in language arts, whatever. You know, It's those kind of conversations to where they're deciding how many FTEs do they need in each of their departments. Well, those are different <laughs> teachers. Those are different values as far as their salary and benefits. But in years past, what I'm saying is we didn't have a range. I understand that the numbers might change, not knowing what retirements are going to come in, not knowing people shifting, you know, that kind of thing. But um, in terms of having that, a, a finite number is your best guesstimate of where we're likely to land. I understand that between now and June, it's likely to change because most of our, we're people, right? We're, we're a district of people. What surprises me is that we have a range at this point in the budget. And I just wanna be assured that, you know, at the very least, you know, we get, you know, whether, whether you choose to be conservative or not, what's the, 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 the most that you would expect to cut in school staffing as opposed to having well, I think that the I think the challenge here that the, is that in the last handful of years we've had row one and then in, and then we've had many rows of saving for light bulbs and copy paper here and there whatever and then we had lots of rows of actual known cuts because we are gonna cut French too, or we are gonna cut this or that and things like that. We're not doing that this year. That's the point here. So we can't have those, they don't exist. We're not gonna have those rows of, of cuts that are very targeted and very specific. Um, we do have, you know, the cuts that are, the, we're not called the right sizing of the, based on enrollment. But I think that has been a fluid, I, we can go back and review, but I think that's been a fluid row in years past as it is. The, the fact that we're not, we don't have called out specific um, right side or downsizing uh, rows is not because we're, um, we're changing our process. It's simply we don't have the same nature of cuts occurring this time around that we have had in the past. Right, and I get that, Eric. And I, I'm not, I'm not, believe me, I'm not expecting to have that same level of detail that we've had in year, years past. I understand that we, you know, because of the nature of the cuts in years past, we were able to have, you know, this particular position in this department listed out. I'm fine with school staffing being lumped together because I understand we're right sizing. 
I'm saying we can probably be a little more specific with the dollar amount that the board receives, understanding, of course, what I just said, which is people move, things change. And hopefully whatever, whatever dollar amount is brought forward um, ends up being more conservative in the end than where we need to be, but within the right ballpark. That's all. I think that's understandable. Um, we, and to Claire again, repeat that um, it was aware that the, the, we've had some time crunch uh, issues. We've had some staffing things that have uh, compounded that. Um, it was, you know, Dr. Battle has been instructed that the, we will have a more concise presentation available at our next meeting in advance of the workshop. Um, but it will be, my understanding, um, Dr. Battle, is it will not be additional to this, uh, and they say it will not be additional, it simply will be parsing out this into more information. Um, I've expressed that also in our officers meeting. If there's additional to this, then we our time frame's going out of the water because we're gonna need to stop and take another look at it, so. And that's all I needed to hear, Eric. I, that, thank you, that's, but, that's what I but, needed. Al but also in terms of a finite number listed above a number one is basing an estimate on a million dollars. So I think that's the finite number that had been used, whether or not that's the number we wanna use is probably what's up for debate. And that's, like, if we wanted to do more conservative then maybe we put in 1.25, and and that's the finite number we go with and then below lisa please correct me if i'm wrong i'm not sure if that if needed has been allocated anywhere does that show up anywhere or has that been added in or is that kind of a one that we have to determine so this is where um this can be placed into that one page mo the interactive model i threw in the fifty thousand dollars the the range right now is simply because um this this process is you know in in the works of trying to determine okay yeah so it, it's actually not reflected in the current numbers that it's something that would be added or shifted well it's included in let me show you one more time sharing this screen so it's included in the numbers that i showed right now because i put it in here so if we were to make that number instead 250 then you can see what that does to your fund balance assumption here. Um, but you know, this can be back to zero, which is where it was when I began the evening. So it wasn't initially included. That's what I wanted to nope. point nope. out. That was added since the last time we met. And I had a couple other questions. Um, the special, the 280,000 was special ed and something else in the elementary elementary yep let me get it up here for you so, so that we can go off from it how much of that is special ed um i have to go back to the sheet let's see one moment and let me see if i can find it Okay. One hundred and twenty thousand is special ed, and one hundred and sixty thousand is elementary. Okay. And I guess my concern—I I don't know if it's necessarily a question—but you know, we spend a lot of time talking about the special ed cross subsidy, and I know in two past budget cycles, if a great number of efficiencies were found in the special ed department. So I'm wondering how we feel confident about taking that $120,000 out of special ed as carryover. It, it's, it's not, okay. It's budget that's been set aside as a contingency, meaning that if we needed to add 
positions we had a budget to pull it from in order to fill those positions. At this juncture being March 11th, we are anticipating that the special ed needs that we have are addressed in our current staffing and that we can continue that throughout the rest of the year. And even if we had to fill them, posi fill positions that don't exist right now, we have underspent on special ed simply because of the learning models that we've had thus far this year. Many districts across the state are most concerned about not meeting maintenance of effort because everybody's expenditures in the special ed area are, de de are less than they have been in the past. So that's, that's where the comfort level comes from me saying, I have a line item sitting here in contingency in case we needed it in a normal year there's often times where that's the case, where Stacy comes in, it's, it's, it's November, and we've got um, a bubble that needs to be addressed, and so he's got to fill it. Where is he going to pull that budget from? I pull it out of contingency when we, revise, when we revise the budget. It wasn't pulled out of contingency at that time, and it still remains, and it could probably go away now. But essentially what you're suggesting is we're taking special ed money and setting it aside for, for our contingency. No, it's not, it's not budgeted in the area of state funding. I'm not, it's not state funds that were planning to be used. It was general unassigned dollars set aside in the area of program 400 identified in case special ed needed assistance. It was part of that cross subsidy. And I'm just suggesting at this point in time, I don't believe you're gonna find it being used. And we wouldn't want to keep it. I mean, I, I so I'm talking to the to the the number cruncher. I'm I'm wondering about the you know the learning side of special ed. It, it just seems odd to me that we would be taking that money out of special ed. I mean, something that was assigned to special ed and and not leaving it there. Um. This if is I, though. This is savings from the current school yes, year, though, yes. right? It's not being cut from no. next year's budget. Is that right? That's, that's this correct. would carry over into the savings next year. for this yeah. year. Yeah. And I guess or an anticipated um, savings. I guess the the final. I guess my final question. I'm kind of in agreement with what Leslie alluded to. Um, I hate to use the term kicking the can, but, you know, we know that we're, you know, we're challenged financially and granted this is an odd year, um, an unusual year because of the pandemic. Um, you know, we haven't, I, I hate to bring up the suggestion of class sizes, but, you know, it, I'm just wondering, you know, do we take a hit sooner rather than later so that we're not, you know, we're not just carrying those additional expenditures down the road? I think the concern I would have with class sizes is we did that for the current year budget and we haven't had a, a year of the kids actually being in class with the new class sizes physically in class, obviously they've been in class, but they haven't been physically in class with the new class sizes we voted to adjust last year. So I, I feel like we need to have at least a year of kids in class full time before we can say, let's inc con consider class size increases again, personally. Others may disagree, but that's that's kind of how I'm looking at it right now. No, I agree with you, Scott. I also get concerned as, as families look at our district, even though we offer these great things, if our class sizes are in, are high in comparison to the other districts, it may be a deciding factor too. And so, you know, do, do we consider other reductions instead? Well, and <clears throat> Leslie, I think the last, the last time we heard about class sizes, we're still doing well in comparison to- I think, I think that is true. I, but but it's 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 something that we want to keep in mind for sure. Yeah. Um. 
Um, I appreciate the um, prudent um, consideration that uh, you are bringing forth. Um, and in most any structure or organization, you would probably be very, well, you would, you're always gonna be right about it. You'd be very right about it. One of the lessons I've learned being here this period of time is there are so many variables that go into this planning process uh, between now and two years from now that um, it always seems like, I mean, two years ago we were saying, if we don't make these cuts right now, we're gonna be done in 2022. But here we are, you know, finding more ways to um, skin the cat, so to speak. And I know that's planning on hope, but um, to me, I'm a little, I also weigh that with the statement we always make is that if we do something significant, it will be in the realm of things that we can't undo. Um, and, and, you know, let's just be frank, the only options available to us are class size and cutting some sort of significant programming in the district. Or everybody contacted legislators and the governor and say, we need two and two, because right now it's zero. <laughs> I think our, our forecast would change if we had 2% to throw in there. We do have a fair amount of um, variables coming. I know we're not planning on making a lot of money on our building sales, but who knows? And uh, we have budgetary uh, events, we have elections coming up forecasts of rosy potential economic upturns, et cetera. So there's just a lot of change and stuff coming along. So it's a tough, it's a tough thing to, to weigh, but those are our choices. Um, again, I, can, I have been repeatedly surprised how we seem to be on the very precipice of, of doom and then you find a way of running a little bit further out there. Maybe a bad analogy, but that's true to it. So. Well, but what keeps coming back really is declining enrollment. I mean, that's, it's, we're fine when we're, when all, I mean, that's why this is relatively straightforward this year because it's declining enrollment with um, the pandemic kind of looped into that, but you know, there's federal funding to, to help cover that. So, it, you know, it, enrollment. Nope. All right, well, I'm not sure that we, well, I we know that we're not here to make any decisions or offer any uh, hardcore guidance tonight. Um, we will look forward to uh, a more um, uh, finite list of adjustments presented at our next meeting. Um, are there any final thoughts or questions tonight out of this workshop? And as I alluded to at the beginning, I guarantee you, you'll have something in the next 24 hours that you forgot to ask. So feel free to put it together in writing and, and send it uh, to Dr. Battle and um, be clarified on it. And then we'll discuss as a group again next meeting. Okay, with that, we're going to adjourn tonight's workshop on the uh, budget adjustments. At this point, we're going to, um, let's, yeah, we're gonna to adjourn to a, a closed session. Um, before you that, uh, Director Alta, uh, how long do you anticipate your session going to be this evening? It's mostly you presenting, correct? Um, half an hour. Hmm? I'm sorry, half what? Half an hour, maybe? I mean. Okay, so I think we'll just plow in straight on to it then rather than taking much of a break here at this point then. Okay, because we are reaching 10 o'clock here. So, all right, we're going to adjourn to a closed session as permitted by Minnesota Statute uh, 13D. 03 to discuss negotiation strategies.